If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Yeah, there goes. The blubbity blah. The blubbity blah. Sending out good vibes. The blubbity blah. Good vibes. The blah. Good vibes. The blubbity blah. Good vibes. Good vibes. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. Coming at you back from winter again from the Great White North. And uh, with Luke Caverns, great chat with Luke Caverns, soon to be friend of the show, Luke Caverns. He's a friend of the friends of the friends of the show, the Snake Bros. He's a cavern bro, and we're going to meet him here in a few weeks, hang out with him, and, uh, you know, something tells me we're going to end up spending some time with this guy over the next few years. We got everybody's uh, favorite podcaster, Ram Ram Dunlop. How's it going? Oh, we got your storm. Did you cut your mullet off? No, I still got my mullet. It's just nicely, it's just, you know, it's just it's nicely, pretty, yeah. nicely permed in the back there. It's like, Herb, like actually permed? <laughs> no, I just use, you know, I use a uh, curly, curly propagating cream. <laughs> I bet you do, bud. I bet you do. <laughs> Well, we got about two feet of snow here. I mean, honestly, we got your storm. It just came over, and that's pretty. It's just a nice little like reminder that you know winter's I almost like got, spring, spring's coming, but it was pretty deep. It's pretty deep. I only got eight inches or so. Oh, okay, that's not bad. It's quite a bit it's here. Very light though. Very light snow. Yeah, like uh, easy to shovel. You know, sometimes in the spring you get that heavy snow that's yeah. Yeah. like a motherfucker to shovel. Yeah. But so uh, my is, strategy this year of just because now that my driveway is like uh you know 300 feet with some drift zones so what's your strategy i just drive back and forth on it with the truck until i have a nice oh that's perfect yeah i nice squish down yeah 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 that's the way to do it yeah but then they haven't plowed the road so <laughs> <laughs> So you Good can't really do that all the way up the road. I mean, I guess you could do that all the way up the road a little bit in four wheel. Well, Amazon wouldn't come. The bus wouldn't have come Monday morning, I would say. Right. But by the time. But wait. No, that's not true. No, they plowed it Sunday. So the bus today's Monday. So the bus would have come Monday morning. Because when I went out Sunday, it wasn't plowed. It wasn't plowed Saturday. It was still blizzard in Saturday. It stopped blizzard in Saturday night, Saturday mm. evening, maybe even before dark a little. Yeah. And then uh, Sunday we went out because we were expecting an Amazon package. Lola was expecting some rubber ducks. And uh, Saturday and they didn't show up because uh, the road was fucked. And then Sunday the road was fucked again. I went out, the road was fucked again. And then when we came back, we went to the lumber yard. And when we came back, the road was plowed. So, Oh, that's good. Yeah, I think it's because we're on the school bus route. So yeah, it's right, right. priority to plow. Yeah. I gotta get my quad going. Once I get my quad going, I have a plow for it and I can oh. plow. I didn't bother because I didn't think it seemed like winter was over, you know? Yeah. And now I'm like, shit, I should have got it fixed because yeah. I wanna plow up like next year I wanna plow up a huge pile of snow in the field out there for the kids to play on and slide on. Yeah, they can make a Ford and a slide. I don't know and you can do that with a quad. That might be a bit much for a quad. But you know what I was thinking is, I seen at at uh, PV Mart, you could get those like those conveyors are cheaper than you think. You know, it's like a couple hundred bucks. And you like plug it in. And it's one of those conveyors you see. So it's just this thing that goes up, fucking, you know, thirty feet in the air, and uh, just turns around. So you just shovel the snow or make your own hill and oh, just. Your own hill, yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. You might as well. You got the yard for it. 
You can, yeah, or I could just buy a plow from a truck and do it like those dudes do at the Walmart. You know, they're just pushing those big, but you know, they got uh, those plows are like ten grand, and I think yeah. they're still like doing the big piles with tractors and shit. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like I can't see my truck pushing a pile of snow up that big without yeah. the tires starting to spin. Yeah, exactly. So this is another long episode, and we've got another long one coming at you next week. It's going to be uh, Cliff Dunning, Earth Ancients. It's really good compliment to this one with Luke Caverns. And then this week we're streaming live with, well, we've got, we've got a couple shows. I mean, we've got a show tomorrow night, which is Tuesday, the 5th of March, live. Um, but Thursday, Randall's going to be with us talking about the eclipse, right, Darren? We're going to talk eclipse with, with Randall. Well, I'm sure we're going to end up talking about all sorts of stuff, but I thought our buddy Randall would be the perfect guy to come on and pop. You know, we want we, there's a few Eclipse tickets left, I think 68 or something like that. So uh, we're trying to get rid of those. And uh, we got Randall coming on because he just, you know, I've heard that guy talk about Eclipse as a bunch. And I would like to get into his whole solar system thing again, like the weird geometry and the ratios in the solar system and all that kind of stuff. And it looks like this comet might interject. Um, I d don't think Randall's coming. I think it's a little rustic for him, but uh, that being said, it'll be fun to chat with him about it. And we are going to hang out with Randall here and shit, I guess two months it's getting into travel season. Yeah. I was thinking about the other day. I said, I wasn't going to travel for a while and then I'm gone and, April and then again in May and then it looks like again in June. So <laughs> bam, bam, bam. But the yeah, kids don't want to do any traveling this year. So I think oh. we might go. They want to do some traveling, but not for we went three and a half weeks last year. So this year I think we'll go uh I think we'll go way up north. Well, you know what? I mean, you also have a big yard now and a big house. And like honestly, that that sort of helps. They've got all kinds of projects they could do there if they've got time off of school, you know, like it's yeah, and the horses are here. They just that's that's what it is. They're excited about the property this year. Yeah, staycation at the property. That's great. They started the tree for it already, and then it got cold again. So well Luke, Luke gets really interesting because he's talking about his presentation about what he's gonna do at the eclipse event, which is at contact at the canyon dot com, by the way. And it's a three day No 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 event. no no contact at the cabin dot com. Sorry, contact at the cabin dot com. But that'll take you to the Eventbrite page. But anyways, Luke's going to talk about sacrifice and stuff. And did you did you hear that this eclipse, April 8th, is the first day of writing for Crowley's Book of the Law? So when Crowley wrote his Book of the Law, it was start, he started it on April 8th? No. And no. that all seven planets line up this April 8th? Neptune, Uranus, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Saturn, and Mars, along with the sun and the moon, all line up through Pisces, looking from Jerusalem to the east. You know, what was the 1,211 days before the jab? Yeah, well, I was going to ask. It was the eclipse, then the, then the jabs, then the eclipse, right? Yeah. Okay, so nothing crazy should happen on the eclipse, then. It should be pretty chill. And then the eclipse crazy thing happened in the middle. The eclipse path will pass through Crowley, Texas, too. Isn't that how far are we from Crowley, Texas? I don't know, but it's also the 30th anniversary of Kurt Cobain's murder as well. So some interesting stuff lining up for April 8th. Cobain murdered himself. What? You know what? You know what's crazy, dude? My kids are fucking listen to Nirvana all the time and they're just telling me about Kurt Cobain I'm like yeah you know I've been to his house a couple times you dummies <laughs> <laughs> I was a fucking Nirvana fan when I was a kid because Nirvana was like dude I remember when Nevermind came out I was like uh, at the 12 when Nevermind came out you were 12 oh yeah that's a, that's an impression that's an impressionable age for music you know yeah, and I was I was twelve when Nevermind came out. I think I was only fucking fourteen when he died, or thirteen, you know, Four, fourteen, I no thirteen when he died, and eleven when Nevermind came out. Wow! So I remember, like, I had all the Nirvana shit, dude. When I was in the like same age as my oldest is now, and now they're all just spitting out this Nirvana stuff, and I just have all this like 
So you were I, had, I pulled out all my Nirvana stuff. I had all my old Nirvana books and all that stuff and gave it to them. And they're all just like, oh my God. I mean, my kids already think I'm pretty cool, but I just, you know, and now they think I'm I, I, extra cool. Oh my God, man. The chat, D, chat DBT lies to me, man. It, it's, it's lying. Oh, yeah, you can't now, trust that. You I can't, can't, I mean, I can't even trust it for basic information now. It's you, scary. You, you listen oh. to no agenda. You should know this. You should not be trusting it. You know what, Chappy? You know what I use my assistant for? Hey, write me a nice, snazzy little description for a YouTube playlist about this. <laughs> yeah, but. But I'm I'm not using it for like you know deep info. But I'm just asking questions because it gives you very direct and and quick answers. You know, yeah. Railroaded you and wasted your time though. Did you did you get that one I sent you the other day? What it says? What about you like going on books that weren't public domain because ChatGPT told you it was fine? It even it even apologized to me. It's like oh I'm so I go didn't. Didn't Carl Jung die in 61? He's like, oh, sorry. Yeah, it was wrong before when I told you he died in 54. I'm like, what? You just admit you're wrong now in two seconds, in a, in a millisecond? And you and you got it. Like, how did you lie to me the first time? It's not a you have GPT-4? No, I don't. Oh, it's still a piece of shit. So, I, so get this. So you said in, uh, you were 11, right? And uh, when, when Nirvana came out? Because in the early 80s. Uh, baby, dude. That was a big deal. What? 90, it, nine, that was a big deal in 92. Yeah, oh, 92. There was a lot of uh, good at rock and stuff coming out in 91, 92. Oh, but I yeah, just went. Dude. Well, I don't know. It was a lot. It was pretty. Run, here's the thing I thought it was all pretty good at the time. When I try and listen to that shit now, man, I'm like, <laughs> God damn it. But I could go back 20 years and that shit's still good. You know, Ooh. like, I don't know. I, and I'll probably get some hate mail for this. But I just find like a lot of that Pearl Jam and Nirvana and and maybe it's just I overdid it at that time. But I can I can listen to like two songs now. And I'm like, all right, fucking change and shit, man. Throwing some that's, fucking that's interesting. Throwing some country western. So I was just looking back at what what songs came out in Canada when I was your age, right? When I was that age, eleven. So for those about to rock by ACDC, Tom Sawyer from Rush, oh, work, working for the weekend by Loverboy. And this hit me with your best shot by Pat Benatar, Betty Davis eyes. Every little thing she does is magic. I mean, those are some classics, but get this. It lies to me. It says Superman's song from crash test dummies. They don't, they weren't around in the early eighties. Uh, I don't know. So what did I have in, uh, let's see what I have. The best albums of 1992. Oh my God. Oh my. See, so sorry. Let me just finish this off. Are you sure about the Superman song? I ask him. He says, right away, they answer me in like split second. I apologize for the confusion. The Superman song by Crash Desk Dummies was actually released in 91, not 81. Thank you for catching the mistake. What? Dude, this is where we're at? So I'm going to win this one, actually, because listen, what we got in 1992, The Chronic by Dr. Dre. I thought you said 91. I thought you were saying it was... Uh, oh, 92. 11. I was 11, 92. I was born in 81. Nevermind came out in 92, I'm sure, isn't it? Ask your buddy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, 1992 albums. Yeah. Dr. Dre, The Chronic, The Original Chronic, R.E.M., Automatic for the People, Self-Titled, Rage Against the Machine, Alice in Change, Dirt, Beastie wow. Boys, Check Your Head. Uh, Katie Lang, what the fuck? Eric Clapton, Unplugged, kind of sucks. Neil Young, Harvest Moon, Pantera, Vulgar Display of Power, Prodigy, The Experience, Garth Brooks, Chase, Faith No More, Angel Dust. How is, never mind, oh, Sublime, 40 Ounces to Freedom. There's an underrated album. Megadeth, Countdown to Extinction, White Zombie. La Sexaristo, uh, Blind Melon, self titled Ice Cube, The Predator. I remember that shit, Ice Cube. We used to think we were so gangster. <laughs> Sonic Youth, uh, Prince, The Love Al Symbol Album, Stone Temple Pilots, Core. Yeah, that's a pretty good lineup. That's a not bad lineup, right? I'm looking for uh, Black Sabbath, Dehumanizer, Iron Maiden, Fear of the Dark. Billy Ray Silas. 
Is that that's an achy breaky heart? <laughs> that was the achy breaky heart year. No. Yep. Nineteen ninety-two. Yeah, in nineteen ninety-two. Billy's Ray Cyrus gave us the inescapable pop country earworm, achy breaky. No, dude, heart. I think I think it's lying to you. I think that's making a mistake. You better double check. Dude, that. I'm on discovermusic.com. Oh, okay. Wow, that's crazy. Not, yeah. Can you hear it? No. No, don't play it because it'll 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 kick us yeah. off. Yeah. Don't tell my heart. <laughs> so. So yeah, interesting music interesting stuff so yeah support the show guys america.ca slash support this is a value for value show uh get it straight you know it's there for free but you're supposed to get some value from it from the 645 episodes this is number 645 and send some value back away at america.ca slash support like a lot of people do already thank you in the form of monthlies uh one uh but we didn't get any one-time donations this uh, this week, which is kind of too bad because we want to mention them now, and you guys are fucking it up because if you don't mention it, we're trying to make a segment out of this shit, and you guys are not holding up your end of the bargain. So please send in some one-time donations with some notes so that I don't have to make it up on the fly. I do want to say thank you because, all right, this one almost counts as a double whammy because we don't have a note. We don't have anything. All we know is it's from the Bowman. I don't even know if it's the Bowman. It just says Bowman. Okay. 99, 99 a month. Wow. On Patreon. Yeah, that's huge. That's uh, You can send a note if you want, Bowman, because uh, that would make you our top supporter. By <laughs> uh, <laughs> a lot. By like 77. <laughs> Per month, but that being said, we do have a lot of people that have been supporting for a long time, so I don't want to degrade what they've done. We have some people that have been giving us 10, 20, 30 bucks a month for years. You could become one of those people, feels good, you feel better about yourself. If you do that, we're still read your note. If you sign up, for, commit to a new monthly america.ca slash support, you can do all that stuff, guys. So send in some one time so I can read some notes next week. It'll be fun, some will be funny, some will suck. Maybe I'll make it funny a little bit. We'll have some fun. And uh, you guys can become part of the show in an even bigger way. Yeah. Uh, Eclipse, right? We're going to hang out with Luke at the Eclipse. Did we plug that enough? Should we should talk about that a bit more? Like, there's only 68 tickets left, guys. You're going to want to get to that. It's going to be great. I guess we'll plug that a lot with Randall this week, too. So, anyway, that's contact at thecabin.com. The other thing we might not have plugged on this show, I get confused now. We're on so many shows doing so much stuff, is we do have the audiobooks trickling out for free on youtube if you go over and subscribe there to adult brain audiobooks on youtube uh you can still get them on the podcast so you know i just want to spell that out because i don't want people thinking you can just go to youtube get all the books for free it's going to take us at current estimates about two years to get all the books out on youtube uh it's you know a video three videos a week and there's a time limit on them so some of our books are three or four videos just to get through one book. Um, and we're still making more content. So the YouTube does get to you for free, but you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. You can become an early access member over at YouTube and get access to some of that stuff early, but not all of it. You go to adultbrain.ca, get to the podcast, and all the books are there right now, immediately, no waiting. Um, so check that out if you want the samples of every single book. I think we're up over almost to we got to be closing in on 120 because yeah. I just I just uploaded five this weekend to the podcast. Yeah, the uh-huh. cathedral one, Fulcanelli, Fulcanelli. Okay, so yeah, can I can I yeah? So we've got Fulcanelli, the Master Alchemist, the Mystere, the Cathedral. That that one is uh. It's full oh man. That's going to be a great one. It's a really, really good book about about basically alchemy in the uh, in the cathedrals and how they built these things, knowing so much, and they hid all this symbolism in there. It's fascinating. And then we've got on the duty of civil disobedience as well from heavy Henry David Thoreau, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Well, you got that up already too. Sun Tzu on the art of war and the Count de Saint Germain which is another fascinating one. It's about that uh, that fascinating guy from the 1800s, 1800s, 1700s. 
Yeah, wasn't there more? And the art of war. Yeah, I said that. Yeah. Or did you did you do all five? I swear there was five. Yeah, I, I read all five. Yeah. yeah. So that's gonna be around 120 total. We're still coming at you. Bam, 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 bam. We're not done with the audiobooks. We are just getting started with this audiobook stuff, guys. So you can check that out in all the different places. Of course, you can buy these things any place audiobooks are sold as well. Um, any place, any place. It takes a while to get out to some of these vendors. Like so 120 on the podcast, you know, there's probably almost 20 on YouTube, 15 or 20 on YouTube. I think there's only 40 some that have made it back through to the Audible. I don't know how many are on Spotify. It looks like most. They get the Spotify quick. So that's the other thing. If you got Audible credits, if you got Spotify credits, I don't even know how the Spotify thing works because you can't get it really in Canada yet. I think it's a mo- mainly a U.S. thing or web-based. I don't know, but they're all there on Spotify and you can get them with credits it looks like so if you have those credits you go there just type in Graham Dunlop I tried uh adult brain adult brain and some of them and it doesn't work so but Graham Dunlop always works that it works in, okay. and we do have different narrators for a couple books too but 95 percent, I guess are probably me yeah it's easier just do your name because I go to Spotify and if I type in adult brain it won't come up all that comes yeah. up is the podcast so yeah. uh but the podcast is there. You can samples, or if you sign up for the podcast, you get access to all 120 books immediately for your membership fee. But like I say, you can buy these things with credits or with whatever, any place you get audiobooks as well. So that's the audiobook thing we're up to. And then there's the other podcast, AmericanOutlaw.ca. You have an email about that one, don't you? Yeah, yeah. This is from Holly about that, our other podcast. Just wanted to thank you all for the outstanding job you're doing on Outlawed, especially the roundups. I super appreciate all the quality deep dives into the COVID and Vax BS. You pick great articles and studies. There's not many other outlets continuing to cover it, and the ones that do aren't nearly as compelling. Keep up the great work, and I'm praying for more listeners and support for you guys. So thank you, Holly. And I also have an email. So if if you send me an email, make sure if you don't want me to read it, make sure you tell me. But this is in regard to our last episode on Grimerica. So that's another way to support the show too. I mean, you can send us emails and feedback and all kinds of stuff, synchronicities, sightings, trip reports. Trip reports. Get high. Tell us about it. No one's done that in a long time. So here, this is from David. He says, hi, Graham. I'm back in cold and damp of England again and catching up on some Grimerica interviews, of which the one with Joanne was highly fascinating and for me, weirdly synchronistic. It got me thinking in the light of what Diana said about how the Beatles are a kind of spiritual catalyst. I was born and have returned to live on the Wirral Peninsula, directly opposite the great city of Liverpool, on the other side of the River Mercy. The Beatles were gaining fame locally around 1962 when I was about seven, but I really didn't get obsessed with their music until the last couple of years before they split up. There's a personal synchronicity that involves a dream in which I met a recently deceased friend in a record store in Liverpool owned by the Epstein family, and then waking up to a phone call that would change the course of my life. Looking back over the years, I don't think the synchronous connections are as tenuous as they may first appear in my summary of the event. If you do another interview with Joanne, I'd like to be I'd I'd very much like to know about John and Yoko's interest in Edgar Casey's work. I understand they'd bought some land in the Caribbean around Bimini because they were anticipating it would rise out of the sea there. According to Larry Warren, whom I consider a much slandered friend, if foolhardy and gullible, and who lives in Liverpool, John had several UFO experiences earlier in life, earlier in life than what came to be documented in New York City. That's interesting. John and the UFOs. UFOs in New York. Larry told me that Mi Pang once told him this, once had told him this. I now consider that Larry has been discredited quite deliberately, though through strategic use of disinformation, by the way, but that's not the subject of this email. Your question about how far the bands of the 60s were involved in the counterculture or infiltrated by the intelligence services is an intriguing one. For my part, I've been pondering the relationship between Ken Kesey a reputedly CIA asset, and the Grateful Dead. They were a band with definite, if subtle, esoteric associations as well. The name comes from a verse in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. In the underworld, the boat of the sun is drawn by the Grateful Dead. 
I didn't, I, I didn't even realize that. Also, Kesey was much very involved, very much involved with the epic concert the dead played at the Great Pyramid in 78. Anyway, I shall leave you in peace in the hope that all is well with you before you judge me completely insane. All the best, my, very, all the very best, my friend. Hey, I'm going to the England. Thanks, David. Yeah. Yeah, Darren might be going there for... Uh, nah, I'm, I've committed. I've committed. I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm going to go. The only th Yeah, I'm going to go. Sean, I might come too. We're not sure yet. to get a look at the dates and that. Well, and I better the flights are fucking retarded, dude. Almost double what uh, they were. When you, what you like, what did we oh. pay? Eight fifteen to London return? I don't know. Can't remember. Now it's like thirteen hundred. Wow. So I'm keeping an eye on that. But well, I think either way, I'll go. Me and Mike will go. Um, I want to go check out. I'm not even. You know, I like the Tyco stuff, but I just want to go meet those guys. We need to shake their hand. Uh, spend a little time in England, not as rest. Hang out with Tony for a day or two. Buddy yeah. Anthony, Tony the yeah. faggot. Over in England. Oh, yeah, don't be a faggot. Donate to Grand America. We should do that at least once for Trevor. He paid 200 bucks to say it on No Agenda. He made Adam Curry say it. We should get that sound bite. Someone should send us that sound bite. Yeah. Anyway. So, so I guess I'll, 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 to... if you want to check out that Tycos thing, I'm going to be at that. The Tycos thing. And I don't know where it is. I will come more prepared for this next week. It's a ways away yet. But I, I have the info. So if I'm going to go to it, I should promote it. And I think we'll also, in the coming weeks, we'll have a way for you to save money on a Cosmic Summit ticket, right? We no, we don't have that yet, though, right? Uh, we don't, but it is coming. I will. We will have it yeah. next week. So we next will have week, it next we'll week. Have I a mean, code for you, we won't make any money, I, but you guys will yeah. save money. Yeah, and that's so. That's the Cosmic Summit in 2024, a new dawn of an old age. And I'm going to go to that. So I'll commit to going to that one. If Darren goes to the England one, we'll split up. We'll split up our resources in that same weekend in mid June. So this is um, curious humans from twelve nations and forty two U.S. states gathered for a remarkable intellectual and interpersonal journey at the Cosmic Summit in Asheville. So this year it's going to be in Greensboro. It's at a beautiful um, hotel. There's a bunch of speakers there. Like who should I? Randall Carlson, Johanna James, Scott Walter, Ben Van Kirkwick, Praveen Mohan, Luke Caverns. I'm just going to click on view more speakers here and it's at cosmic Um, So I do want to start talking about it, but we will have a code for you next week. Um, where did the uh, other speakers go? It's not popping up here. It worked yesterday. It worked yesterday. Coyotes on the cams. Anyways, I will leave it at that for now. Um, Too late to shoot. Believe it when we say Hugh Newman is going to. Um, yeah, the, believe it when we say that it's going to be an amazing event with a bunch of cool researchers and people. And If I come to England too, I want fucking proper weed this time. I ain't smoking that hash shit. Get your shit together. Seriously. Tony will figure it out. Because Mikey too. I'm going to go with Mikey with. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, you know us. Mikey and Aaron Karate. Me and Mike. Me and Mike smoked a jay in every ancient site in Egypt, including the Queen's Chamber or the Great Pyramid. <laughs> I don't, I don't see time. that stopping. But the hash sucks, man. I just I have some hash here. I smoke it once in a while, but I can't get off on that shit all the time. I do. Before I forget, I got to give a shout out to John. Uh, if you listen, dude, I went out for lunch the other day with my buddy Kale, and dude picked me off for my voice. We well, do have over. that stoned Canadian accent. Comes over and he's like, uh, "Excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, do you have a podcast?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Yep." And uh, so yeah, turns out he listened. So thanks, John. He then he was my uh, my waiter, my server. So I told him I'd give him a shout on the show and had a nice lunch there, and he seemed like a nice guy. He listened to me rant to Kale about things. Kind of unrelated to the show, kind of related because, you know, it all starts to blend together when the Western world starts to collapse. So, because here's the thing, all my normal, but this is just like one of my steel working buddies. You know what I mean? Well, he's pretty, he's pretty cool. He's always been pretty open, but you know, he also didn't listen to me on some other stuff that he should have. <laughs> and uh, and now, now these guys are all like, so <laughs> what do you think is going to happen next? <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, I should get into consulting. Yeah, you'd be like, don't think I'm as prophetic as I, w- I was all the time. Hey, wait, I still have six days left for Trudeau to quit. Yeah. Well, it's my birthday next week, too. Yeah. Sunday, right? March, uh, March 10th? 10th. March 10th, Sunday, yeah. Sunday, so I'll be 43 next nice. day. So nice. anyway. What do you got? You got a bio for uh, Luke? You said yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. He's uh, he's got a degree in anthropology. He's taken and taken to education entertainment to continue his studies in early civilization. His interest in antiquity first began in 2004 with the Trojan War. He was seven years old. As time went on, my interest in or his interest in classical history grew until he moved on from studying Greco-Roman history to studying Egyptology during college in 2018. Shortly thereafter, he picked up studying Mesoamerica and Andean civilization. Every week, he posts videos discussing and exploring the lives, accomplishments, turning points, and mysteries around the ancient Americas, Egyptians, or the Greeks and Romans. He's got a series coming up on Alexandria. And there's a link in the show notes to his, uh, his link tree. I mean, he's done some amazing exploration in the Maya, which we get into in this, in this uh, podcast. I mean, the amount of oh, overgrown temples and pyramids is mind-boggling. I might have to go check that out, too. I was talking to my buddy, Rye. Keep to get that done, no. dude. Yeah, you know Rye. He lives in Campeche or whatever. He's he's thinking about doing some of those tours, too. So He could be our Mexican dude. Yeah. Our resident Mexican. Yeah. All right, guys. Enjoy the chat. Luke Caverns. start i'll just hit post and we started okay awesome. welcome to Grand america luke caverns yes sir yeah thank you guys so much for having me um it's always a pleasure to uh come and talk with anybody who's interested in ancient mysteries and lost civilizations and uh and i have heard i have heard of the podcast Grand america um i don't know i don't know how but in passing for quite some time now and so it's oh, good uh it's nice to uh finally receive an invitation and get on with you guys yeah yeah for sure yeah well we're going to talk about the eclipse too because you're going to be there with us uh, at this little festival at the eclipse but i mean i'd love to start with just your your latest kind of escapades through the maya jungle and stuff i mean i think i'm super fascinated by what what's going on down there and and just your your trip sounded absolutely interesting so, I mean, I'd love to hear like a little bit about that, maybe the Reader's Digest version of that, and we can sort of <laughs> talk about that. Yeah, well, um, in a nutshell, I, I think the Maya world is really, well, I mean, it, it really is the most untapped um, and most, uh, gosh, it's it's a well-known, um, you know, ancient civilization, but it, at the same at the same time for... Uh, how vast the Maya world was and, um, you know, just how many cities they had and how large their population was. I mean, their population was three times larger than medieval Europe at the height of medieval Europe. That's wow. how that's how large it was. And um, and for it being that large, you know, um, percentage wise, I mean, I, I would say that it's it's the least documented of the well-known um, ancient civilizations. I mean, uh, we, for instance, in my on my last trip, um, just to give a perspective as to how many lost 
cities, if you want to call it that, or really just lost temples and pyramids and palaces um, and U-shaped um, plaza complexes. There, there's a lot of different structure types that the Maya built. And just to give an idea of how many of those have been lost in the jungle, um, I was at the uh, I was at the uh, capital of the Maya Snake Kingdom, um, just if you know, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago in December, and uh, and to get there, I mean, man, you're driving three hours into into the middle of the jungle. Um, and this the- is Mexico, right? And you're just yeah. in Mexico. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is in Mexico. This is in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and so you're driving three hours from the nearest town. Um, and, uh, and so when we arrived there, I mean, there, you, you're walking around. So Kalak Mool is, is the name of the city. There's a park at Kalak Mool. It, it's, it, well, I mean, it's an archeological park. And so there's sidewalks that lead you everywhere. But as you're walking up to the main temples, if you just look off to your side, as you're walking down the trails, there's just pyramid, 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 pyramid everywhere. And on the outskirts of the cities, there are these giant reservoirs because out in the middle of the jungles, um, there aren't rivers going through there. So they're having to get their fresh water out of out of reservoirs, whether they're there naturally or whether they created them. Um, and so around the reservoirs, you can expect to see ancient structures. But but these reservoirs also sit on the outskirts of the park. So when you're sitting there, you can walk up to the edge of the reservoir and you look across and you see the tree line popping up on, you know, 200 yards away on the other side of the reservoir. And I'm looking at it with my with my binoculars and you can see the tree. You can see where trees are coming out of the ground, you know, 10 meters, 10, 15 meters uh, higher than the rest of them. So, you know, that there are structures back there. Dude, I'm talking giant pyramids like. um, (laughs) okay, I. Uh, somebody asked me, uh, one of my one of my good friends asked me the other day, how many giant pyramids I thought that there were uh, lost lost in the jungle. OK, so <clears throat> I, I'll say this, um, if I can repeat the exact way that, that I told him um, pyramids that are. Well, let's say the largest pyramid in Mesoamerica is going to be the Ladanta and the El Tigre uh, pyramids that are at the city of El Mirador, which is in the northern Paten jungle in Guatemala. Okay, those are probably about two thirds the height of the Great Pyramids. Okay, (laughs) and I I just I just want to emphasize how big these are, because two thirds the height, you're like, oh, really? That's it? these look like a mountain, man. I mean, you walk, you feel like you walk all the way up it and you look up and you've only gone halfway. Okay. So pyramids that are that big, I would say pyramids that are, that are comparable to the size of the pyramids that we see in Egypt. Um, you know, let's, let's discount the pyramids on, on the Giza plateau, but let's talk about the red pyramid or the bent pyramid pyramids that are about that size exist in the Maya world. And I would say that there's probably, I would say at most, there's probably a dozen more of them out there somewhere in the jungle. Um, I would say there's there's about a dozen. Pyramids that are, let's say, the size of Menkure's pyramid on the Giza Plateau, the smallest ones, I would say there are hundreds out there. And then pyramids that are that are half the size of that, I would say there's thousands yeah. that are out there. That's and, incredible. Uh, and like and like you were saying before, all the all the Egyptian pyramids are smaller than those ones you mentioned. Like they're they're smaller than the the massive pyramids that are in in Mexico, right? Yeah, except yeah, yeah. For the yeah. top four, except for like Red Bent and the two big ones on the on the plateau. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that that the that the bent the bent is larger than any of the Maya pyramids that we know of. Um, but yeah, except for the Red Pyramid, um, except for the Red Pyramid, the Bent Pyramid, and um, and the pyramids, the two great pyramids or, you know, Khufu and Khafre's yeah. pyramids. Um, but when you're looking at the the pyramid of Saqqara, Zosser's pyramid, uh, or you're looking at the pyramid of Maidum or, you know, um, any, any of these other pyramids. Yeah. I mean, th- those are going to be comparable to uh, the size of the pyramids in the Maya world. And, um, and I mean, man, there, there are, there are thousands and, and now let's take all the pyramids in the Maya world. Um, I would say easily 10,000 have not been discovered. Easily 10,000. 
the reason I say that is because I walked in I walked in an area on the last day of the trip and this this episode hasn't come out yet. Um I walked in we had a local guide from Ina take us out to a uh there's a road that leads to Kalakmul and off the road you hike off into the jungle for a couple hours and you eventually reach this city. And the city that the the area that I walked around was probably the size of maybe three football fields. And during that, in that little area, we documented 18 pyramids just in that little area. And they were all around us outside of that area as well. Now that was a 45 minute drive south of Kalak Mool, which is was the center of the Maya snake kingdom, the most powerful kingdom in, in uh, the Maya world, or at least during the classic period. And so as you're driving south of Kalak Mool to get to this city where we walk two hours in the jungle, the entire 40 minute drive, driving at, you know, 40, roughly 40 miles an hour, all along both sides of the road, it was just pyramid, 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 pyramid for a 40 minute drive until we walked two hours to get to the next city. That next city that we were at wasn't just another city. It was still a part of Kalak Mool. So Kalak Mool, that one city spread for so long that you could drive for 40 minutes at 40 miles an hour and you still weren't outside of the wow. city. You still weren't outside of, of the population. And then you would drive for three more hours. So we go south and then we turn east and we go uh, go back into Quintana Roo and all the way back out to the city of Zibanche, which is uh, closer to the uh, closer to the um, to the Carib to the Caribbean Sea. <sighs> Dude, it, it was just endless population all the way, all the way out there. You're looking off in the farmlands, like out there in the sticks, and it's just pyramid, 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 pyramid. It was if you were walking around in that world, there was never a place where it was just like vast empty space before you got to the next city. It's all it was all inhabited, all of it. I I, I just don't know how I can stress it enough how much of that world is completely lost to us. So Another, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I know I'm going on a rant. This one last thing. Um, <clears throat> we're way out in the, we're way out in the sticks and we see this massive pyramid. One of the biggest pyramids that we saw in the entire time that we were there. It, it was sitting in the middle of a farm, but the pyramid. Uh, so the whole farm is cleared out. And the pyramid goes up, you know, I'm not sure, maybe it's 150 feet tall. And there's these giant trees growing off of the top of the pyramid that the local Maya farmers, you know, they had leveled everything in the farmland around it other than what's on this pyramid. And right there in front of the pyramid is a 12 foot, foot tall Stella that tells the story of, you know, I'm guessing the ruler that possibly lived atop the pyramid or, or of, the, uh, of the local city. And I took a drone out and I flew the drone over to the Stella and I got documentation. This hasn't come out yet, but you can read the hieroglyphs. I mean, I can't read it, but somebody could read the hieroglyphs on the Stella sitting out in the middle of nowhere, probably never been officially documented or studied before. Well, probably somebody's documented that it's there, but that was just one of that was just one of 11 days straight of seeing dozens of things like that every single day. It just. <laughs> and, and you're not uh, are you an anthropologist or in, yeah. in anthropology yeah so um so uh despite my best efforts of trying to do something more realistic uh early in my late teens and early 20s um i just couldn't escape the fact that i love ancient history and uh and my love for history just came out of me and you know despite everything else in life and um and so I eventually uh, ended up going back to school. I got a degree in anthropology, but I really just got a degree in anthropology because I knew I wanted to go into edutainment, you know, education, entertainment. And I got my degree in anthropology just to show that I at least know yeah. I, that I at least have the foundational knowledge of, of what it takes to be an ethical anthropologist. Nowadays, I'm probably more effectively just a historian, you know? Yeah. Well, what, what, what do they think? Like, what is, what is, what does the academic community think about this? Like, why is this not a more studied subject? Well, um, man, it comes down to a lot of different factors. So um, one of the things is that Mexico is just very poor. You know, um, they don't have the 
Well, there, there's two things. Um, Mexico is very poor. And, uh, you know, of course, they put a, they really do put a lot of money into archaeology. But the thing is, they put more of their money into archaeology uh, that's going to bring money into Mexico's economy, right? So they're going to do things to excavate and study sites like Palenque or, or, Chichen, or Itza. Chichen Itza. You know what I mean? They, they want the money coming in. Um, so going out in the middle of the jungle and documenting a site... Uh, the president of Mexico, he could really care. He could really care less about that. I mean, if I were to, if I were to knock on his door and tell him, "Hey, man, I just found this lost city," he would be like, "Oh, okay, yeah, you and every other every other archaeologist that I know of, I don't, I don't care." Um, you know, they have a lot more lucrative things that are going on. So they're so they're um, they're extrapolating what they can out of you know their more popular sites, and they invest money into that because that makes the most sense. Um, they also don't want gringo money, you know, so they don't have like a Jeff Bezos can't knock on the door of uh, the Mexican president and offer, you know, $500 million to completely excavate, you know, X, Y, and Z city because they don't want, uh, they don't want Western, Western money or Western hands in their pockets or, or, you know, pulling strings and telling them what to do anymore. So, you know what I mean? Their economy is not great and they also don't take Western money. So it's kind of like uh, they don't really have the funds or the urgency to uh, to investigate a lot of these sites. However, there's also have you guys heard of the Maya train? So, yeah, I th- yeah, yeah. So so they're building a they're building a train right now that's uh, going to be a circuit around the Maya world um, in Mexico at least. I don't think it's going into Guatemala, although it might be going into Guatemala. Um, but from what I know, you're going to be able to hop on the train in Merida or Cancun, and you're going to be able to go to sites like Cohun Leach, uh, which is an amazing site in Quintana Roo, like really the most amazing site I think I've ever seen. Probably my favorite site that I've ever been to. Uh, f- then from Cohun Leach, you'll be able to visit uh, Kalak Mool, and then you'll be able to go see uh, Ushmal and Chichen Itza. It's going to take you to all the main uh, Maya sites in the Yucatan. And that is going to explode uh mexico's economy i mean you know people are a little bit weary about going to mexico um for the most part you're going to be okay i mean like m- people there are just like anybody else you know they they uh they want to get along and and live a good you know life um <clears throat> i was nervous when i first went but but this uh this Maya train is going to make Westerners feel so much more secure, you know, cause you're going to have a place to stay every night. You get off the train, you come back on the train. Everything you do is, is, uh, you know, you're being looked after the whole time. So it's going to explode the economy. Um, and when that happens, we're going to see a whole lot more excavations going on in the areas around the Maya train because it's, uh, well, it's obviously, it, it was already happening actually, we we saw a uh, we saw an entire city and you know a lot of archaeologists are against the maya train right now because it's cutting through they can't build the train without cutting through cities like they're having to demolish entire pyramids just to build the train and wow. uh and so they built a train dude i'm telling you it's going to be badass like it in by 2030 you're going to be you know, taking the train and you're going to be looking off to your right and left and there's going to be pyramids excavated. You know, you're going to be driving by pyramids or, or riding by pyramids on this train um, that goes straight through cities that they had to bulldoze a lane through the city. And that's, that's really unfortunate. But at the same time, I'm one of two ways about it because, you know, them by demolishing some parts of certain sites, we also get to learn so much more about the rest of the Maya world um, that if we didn't do that, there may not be the economy in Mexico to learn more about it. So that's a long winded answer, but that's kind of no, the situation no, that's of what's yeah. going on in Mexico. Right yeah, now. no, I like it. I mean, go Darren, do you got something or I want to. Plus you need some, you, the more people that see that shit, the better explanations you're going to start to get, right? Like some of the best explanations I'm getting for Egypt stuff are from people that hadn't gone to the pyramids when we started this podcast, yeah. you know, including our, our mutual friends, the Snake Bros, Ben and Russ, who are in Egypt right now with our other, yep. sorry, not Ben and Russ, Russ and Kyle, yep. who are in Egypt right now with our other buddy, Ben. Yep. I think Brad and Lauren, oh, the whole crew's there this time. Oh, yeah, they're all there. 
Yeah, um, I'm, yeah. I'm, about, I'm about sick to my stomach that I'm not there with them. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, right. before you I'm move on to that. Pictures, but then you just think of the flights, man. It's a pain to get over there. But it is beautiful when you're there. But I mean, the point, and, and I would add Jeffrey Drum to that list. The point being that, you know, it's just guys like this getting to the pyramids that come up with these new explanations that we haven't fucking heard before. So who needs to get to the Maya to really crack it open, you know? Well, the thing is, they've been the problem I have with it. The scientists have known about this for a long time. I mean, uh, we narrated this book for audio called The Prehistoric World or Vanished Races. I don't know if you ever heard of this book. It's a pretty mainstream book from 1885. So this is going okay. back to 1885. And they're talking about the Maya. There's a huge Mayan chapter in there. And it's one of these guys, uh, Charney, um, is impressed with the number of the ruins in this state. So he's talking about uh, Tabasco. He says, okay. I am daily receiving information about the ruins scattered all over the state of Tabasco, hidden in the forest. The imagination fails to realize the vast amount of labor it would involve to explore even a tithe of these ancient sites. These mountains of ruins extend over 12 miles. We see the hollows in the ground whence the soil was taken for the construction of these pyramids, but they did not consist merely of clay bricks too entered into their construction, and they were strengthening walls to make them firmer. These structures are more wonderful than the pyramids and the other works at Teotihuacan, and they mm -hmm. far surpass the pyramids of Egypt. So this is like science guys in the late 1800s knew about the state, which was just next to the one you're talking about, right? Tabasco versus like Campeche, right? Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, Tabasco connects to Campeche, which would be, um, you know, Tabasco, you're getting really close to the Yucatan Peninsula, traditional Yucatan. So you have you have uh, you have some Maya sites in Tabasco, but that's kind of where the Maya world meets the Olmec world as well. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. So it just feels to me like they've known about all this, but they haven't really. It's just been like you like you're saying, it's just not it's under under investigated and, and uh, un undiscovered still, you know, they but they but they've they've known about and I just get mixed up in, in all this like the. The Inca, the Maya, the Aztec, the yeah. Toltec, the like it it's all like I just I even after it, reading the book, I'm just like Man, it, let me tell you, it's a whirlwind. It is a whirlwind. So okay, so the best way that I can describe it, um, and then I'm gonna tell you something that I haven't I haven't talked about this yet. Um, it was probably the most shocking thing that I saw when I was in Mexico. Um and uh, oh man, I don't wanna um I don't want to, I think this, this site was called Balam coup that I was at. Don't let me forget that. Um, so, um, so the best way I can describe the study of the Maya world is studying Egypt. I'm not going to say it's easy because it's complex, but understanding the hist the historicity of Egypt and, and how it begins and ends. Now, of course, you know, there's a whole lot of speculation as to, you know, really how old is Egypt? Um, I tend to, I'm, I'm pretty conservative in my approach, but let's just talk about the traditional historicity of Egypt where, uh, you know, you have, you have Scorpion or Narmor or Menes, well, you know, whatever he goes by, um, who is the, who is the original Pharaoh of Egypt that comes up from upper Egypt and smites the King of lower Egypt and unites the two lands in 3100 BC, maybe 3150 BC. And then that history goes from, you know, that's, that is the end of pre-dynastic Egypt. We now begin the dynastic age. And then you get into the old kingdom, the intermediate period, uh, the middle kingdom, the next intermediate period, uh, the new kingdom, the next intermediate period. And then eventually you get to, you know, the Persian conquest. And then you get to the Ptolemaic era, era where, you know, you now have Greek pharaohs. And then it ends with Cleopatra. It's really straightforward from beginning to end. It's just a straight line from from beginning to end, exactly like the Nile River. It's just a straight line. It makes the study of Egypt um, really easy to conceptualize in your brain. The Maya world is the exact opposite of that. And the, all of the ancient Americas as a whole are the exact opposite of that because largely, let's, let's stick to the Maya world. Um, the Maya world acted exactly like ancient Greece. They were city-states. It wasn't, a lot of people say the term Mayan empire, um, which, which isn't accurate at all. It, it was never an empire. They couldn't get along at all, um, exactly like Greece. So you have these different cities that act as a whole country. You know what I mean? Like Athens in ancient Greece was a city that had its own army, its own military, you know, its own government. 
so it makes the it makes the study of uh, it makes the study of the Maya world and uh, and even further at the uh, the entire Mesoamerican and South American world um, incredibly complex to study and just to wrap your mind around, you know. Um, and we also Isn't don't have just like an expanse on the fuel system. It kind of seems like feudal to me, almost like the expanse of those lords into yeah. like if. If those dudes in England had enough room, you know, they could have had their own cities eventually. They almost did, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. In some ways. So, yeah, that's kind of interesting to think about that that was sort of system was all over Mexico probably at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, definitely, definitely at the same time um, as uh, as medieval Europe, you know. Um, if they and- got fucked up, do you think? Do you think that was the like it was the Spanish right when they came over that caused the problems? Sorry, these, that these, we're these, well, these pyramids in the Maya they're not like pre Younger Dryas. They're, they're yeah, yeah. So so cities were killed by the Spanish when they came over, right? Is that what we're thinking? Well, it's um, part of it was yes. So but so just like in the um, in the world of Egypt. Uh, you have your different time periods. So you have your main three time periods. You have the old kingdom, you have the middle kingdom, and you have the new kingdom. In the Maya world, you have the pre-classic, the classic, and the post-classic. Now, here's the thing about the Maya world and how we can say pretty confidently in how old a lot of the pyramids are. Um, So rather than the pyramids in Egypt, where they were, uh, you know, the traditional explanation is that they're constructed to be the tomb of a pharaoh, right? Um, But at the same time, um, in the vast majority of in the vast majority of the pyramids, there is no body to be found. Right um, <clears throat> in the Maya world, the pyramids are built generationally. So if you were to ex- if you were to cut an ent- if you were to take a pyramid and cut it in half and pull it apart, you would see multiple generations of buried royal families inside the pyramid. And so you carbon date the bones, and you know how old that part of the pyramid is right and so a lot of these bones um classic period goes back to about 200 ad so 1800 years ago and that classic period lasted until mysteriously about 800 ad and then all of a sudden we have this we have the beginning of the end of the maya um at this point at this point they have a very extremely complex language that is far more complex than ancient Egypt in their numerical system uh, and their study of, of, of astronomy. Um, it, it just, oh man, it's, it's insane. Um, they, they, in, in a lot of aspects, they were, they were a lot more knowledgeable than even the Egyptians. Just, just their language was more complicated in their, their understanding of mathematics, at least as far as what can be definitively proven that nobody argues on. Right. Um, so all of a sudden, as we're reading their, uh, as we're reading their hieroglyphs and all the different hieroglyphs are all propaganda. So you read the hieroglyphs in one city, it tells you what's going on there and they're warring against this city. And so you have to decipher all the different hieroglyphs in all these different cities to get a big picture of what's going on leading up to this mysterious, uh, collapse. And so what's pretty funny, uh, as a side note is, um, is the Maya actually call these wars, these great wars that are happening between all the major city states, for whatever reason, we don't know the reason, they call them the Star Wars. And that's where the term Star Wars comes from. And one of the major players in the Star Wars was the city of Tikal, which is actually the rebel base on Yavin 4 in Star Wars. If you go look at if you go look at the rebel base, it is Tikal in Guatemala. So George Lucas took that right out of Maya, um, Maya archaeology, which is pretty cool. But anyways, so you see these you see these wars going all around the uh, the classic Maya world, and uh, and they're doing all sorts of other things like they're accidentally poisoning their own water supply. Um, a lot of cities are, you know, committing like acts of huge deforestation, which are messing up their own farmland because, uh, you know, it messes up the weather patterns in, in their area, and um, and eventually you know, the Maya people grow to resent these God Kings that rule over them. And so there's a lot of different things that are, that are slowly dwindling the Maya world and making it weaker and weaker and weaker. And there's also this big war over, uh, Teotihuacan. They have a huge influence in the Maya world and half of the Maya world wants to purge Teotihuacan. It's an influence. And the other half wants to be pure Maya. So there's all these different, um, factors playing into it. And then there's a, and then there's a volcano 
in about 800 AD that erupts in Chiapas, Mexico, and spreads this black plume of smoke and ash and debris all over the all over the Yucatan. And you can just imagine that the Maya people whose whose quality of life has quickly dwindled, they hate their, you know, they're going to resent their god kings that supposedly have the uh the blessings of the gods over them. And now all of a sudden there's this dark omen that's cast over all of the Yucatan. And at that exact same time, the entire Maya world abandons every single city that they have, and they all move northward into the Yucatan and start again. But they never quite reached that height that they were at. So that's 800 AD. About 600 years later, the Spanish show up. And, uh, and by the time the Spanish showed up, the Maya world was already dwindling and the Aztecs who had come from somewhere in the American Southwest, potentially Arizona, potentially Utah, um, you know, maybe, maybe Northern Mexico, the Aztecs are now conquering all of Mesoamerica and they're planning, they're planning an assault on the final remaining pockets of the Maya world right before the Spanish show up. Wow. So that's kind of, that's kind of the lead up to, uh, to, and you know, that's kind of the lead up to the fall of Mesoamerica as a whole, because I mean, man, only um, only within a year, Mesoamerica falls to the Spanish, and you know that's largely due to disease, but you know, of course, also conquering. As a side note, I know I'm kind of rambling on and on, but that dis- the disease that was going through the Americas was so devastating. This is this is a pretty remarkable statistic that my. Uh, my mentor, uh, Dr. Ed Barnhart, he came up with when he was working on his doctorate. <clears throat> so many people died in the Americas that if you took every Spaniard living throughout all of the Americas and you put a sword in their hand and you had them cut down a Native American, every, each of them cutting down a Native American every single second for 50 years straight, it wouldn't come close to the amount of Native Americans that actually died in the first 50 years. Wow, that's North Americans, like all over. That's 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 North Central and South America. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's pretty pretty remarkable. So that's uh, so that's kind of the that's kind of the world leading up to the fall. Now, the thing I was going to tell you that was the shocking thing that I saw when I was in Mexico. The most remarkable, um, the most remarkable, um, sight that I saw there was these murals at Balam Coup that are, man, it, it was like. It was like I was it was like I was looking at a piece of artwork that was so complex and so large. I mean, it's probably it's probably 10 or so feet tall and 40 feet long. And it's just this intricate 3D depiction of all these Maya rulers mixed with their gods in this one image. It's a 3D stucco image that's painted in solid red cinnabar i mean it when i was looking at it, it it's like you're on drugs looking at a looking at these murals and they sit right over um a cave that goes you know i don't know how far de- how far down in the world it goes but it's this huge it's this like really ominous kind of scary entrance that goes down into the maya underworld that they called shibalba it was the most amazing thing that I've seen in the in the Maya world. The most impressive thing that I've ever seen. We were the only people to visit this site on a Saturday, and that that Shibalba cave that was that that was underneath the doorway beneath these murals. Not one person had ever gone in there to study anything in there in twenty five years. Wow! Just completely neglected. Absolutely no visitors at all. No archaeologist had been there in any recent time whatsoever. And uh, and I messaged uh, one of my mentors about it. And he was like, he's like, it's amazing how that is one of the most impressive sites in the world. Um, and it's just completely, completely neglected. So it's, maybe, maybe we shouldn't uh, say anything about it. Just keep it, keep it a little secret like that, you know, before it gets yeah, over. Yeah, around. well. Well, uh, yeah. And I also imagine when the Maya train comes around, probably a lot more people are going to go see it. But man, uh, anybody watching right now should look up the red murals of uh, the red murals at Balamku. It's pretty amazing. So Darren mentioned the, uh, you know, the political aspect. And I, I heard, I think it was from reading this book, but also something else that I heard there was when the Spanish came over and they, 
they found the political aspect of the of the mm-hmm. and it might have been these city states now this is where i don't know if it was like aztec or maya or or uh what are the other ones the the inca but mm-hmm. but they they came back to to europe and they're like there's no there's no kings and queens it's like anarchy it's like uh they they started to sort of spread this sort of i would say it's dis- disinformation about sure. the political structure of of this area and and they're calling it i guess like savage or barbarian probably yeah. savage at the time yeah. but really what they missed out is that it was more it was more democratic than than the the system that was in europe at the time i mean apparently these people would vote chiefs in and out and yeah. there'd be two two you know running i don't know if it was like a city state or if it was the whole conglomerate of city states but they were able to like get rid of chiefs that they didn't like and vote chiefs two different sure. ones to share the responsibility and and you know that whole that whole sort of maybe it was even a more fair and successful political system sort of got just washed away <clears throat> or, or or whitewashed in a way yeah yeah um okay so i'm so let's let's go with the big three. So you've got the Aztec, you've got the Maya, and you've got the Inca. You know these are these are your main three um, civilizations. Uh, you know your 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 largest, most powerful civilizations at the time of Spanish arrival. So the Maya, after their fall of 800 AD, they moved to much more of a uh, kind of like a councilship of of these lords that um, you know the king is gone now, and now it's a council. And they put their gods, they put their pantheon of gods at the forefront of their society. You know what I mean? They're giving all the glory to their gods and they are kind of democratic councils that sort of govern govern over their people. And these councils will go meet up with councils at other city states. And they're all kind of, they're connected in this web, right? It's it's um roughly democratic, um, you know, a lot more similar to like some kind of republic or some kind of democracy, right? Um, I think in the Aztec world, uh, the Aztec world, I would say it's more similar to Macedonia, like uh, Alexander the Great. You know what I mean? They're just, they're this population that uh, pops up out of nowhere. You know, they're these, uh, oh man, they're, talk about, okay, the Aztecs were savages. They were actually, they were, they were, and when I say savage, I don't just mean they're like, I don't I don't just mean they're like barbaric people, you know, that know no civilization because they built incredible cities. What I mean, savage is like savagely violent, you know, and cruel. And uh, and uh, I won't go down that whole rabbit hole. But I mean, they really did some some absolutely cruel things as far as what we know uh, to their history and the way that they betrayed their allies is is very cruel. Um, But they, you know, they were an advanced society, you know, certainly very similar to the Maya, but they're more like Macedonia under Alexander, this young civilization just sweeping across Mesoamerica and slaughtering everybody. Uh, (laughs) You know, I mean, just just boom out of nowhere. And they had a king. So that was more like a monarchy, you know, Moctezuma. uh, He's he's their emperor, their king. Right. When you say Mesoamerica, what 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 is that? Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica would be Mexico. What we know today is Mexico City, uh, Lake Texcoco. You know that's where Mexico, uh, you know, really draws a lot of its roots. Teotihuacan was was there, which is the capital of of Teotihuacan, um, which are your your giant pyramids of the sun and the moon, um, and then your temple of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, so you have that there, but then you also have the city which is gone today, uh, Tenochtitlan, which was the Aztec capital. That's now completely okay. covered up okay. by Mexico City. Um, and and Teotihuacan was long gone. It, it, it had been gone for about a thousand years by the time the Aztecs uh, really rose to prominence. Maybe like nine hundred years by the time the Aztecs rose to prominence. And um, <clears throat> I think that's right. And so um, now the Aztecs are, are sweeping across Mesoamerica. So that goes from Mexico City all the way, you know, down uh, Mesoamerica. Probably goes halfway through Honduras, maybe Nicaragua, all the way up to like modern day Cancun. So it's that. You know, it's that arc of the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and the Aztecs had complete control over that. They were a monarchy. And then um, in the Inca world, you also had emperors. But, you know, man, it's kind of like it's kind of like if you were it, uh, their emperors, at least as far as we know at the time, were kind of more like uh, what's the right way to say it? it? It wouldn't be like you were living under Nero in Rome. 
You know what I mean? Um, or, or maybe Nero is not a good, not a good example. Um, but they weren't living under a necessarily oppressive government, right? So when um, when the Spanish are invading <laughs> during wartime, uh, the Inca people were at least tried to have. It seems like tried to have a decent enough society where the men could volunteer to be a part of the army to fight against the Spanish. But at some point, if it came around the season, like harvest season, and you wanted to go back home and work on your farm, that was fine. You could, you could just leave, you could just leave your post in the military uh, at the detriment of the Inca empire as, as a whole. But the Inca empire was actually an em empire uh, ruled by an emperor, but these seem to be much more, um, less destructive emperors than, than we see in Rome, you know? Um, okay. so that's kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of the government set up in, in central and South America at the time of, a at the time of, uh, European contact, but certainly even though they had an emperor, it's much probably a bit more democratic and, and uh, and peaceful than these, you know, absolute monarchies that, that, that were seen in Europe, you know? Right. Yeah. 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 That's great. Now that's a fantastic explanation. Yeah. So, Darren, where do you want to go from here? Well, I'd like to know what happened to all those people. I mean, was it like, uh, I mean, the Rome, the Roman stuff gets kind of blamed on getting too big for the britches and, yep. and uh, you know, getting obsessed with gender and all these <laughs> other sorts of, I guess they call it sort of debauchery at the time or the loss of all their sort of, morals for lack of a better term and you know is that what gets the maya too because i mean you're talking about it would seem like a reduction of almost you know maybe a couple orders of magnitude by the time the spanish arrive and if the aztec are moving in you know was they moving in because they were killing all but it seems like the mines were already gone then so what what got them was it just an overpopulation thing that they used up all their resources because it seems like the same thing. It's not just the Mayans. I mean, it's the Indians from one end of the continent to the other are sort of just gone by the time mm -hmm. the major Europeans get here. They're already gone by 90% or 95% by most counts. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, obviously you're talking about like two and a half continents, right? You know, North Central and South America, if you want to consider Central America a continent of its own, but, um, so, it you know it's obviously like multifaceted what what happened to them. But let's let's say so, yeah. So this is where this is where it really begins. If you kind of scroll up to the Bahamas, I will explain. Uh, I'll explain to you. I'll, I'll explain to you and your and your audience uh, the basically the fall of of Native America. So you have um, you have a Columbus that arrives in the Bahamas um, in fourteen ninety two, and uh, over the course of the next oh 30 years um they begin to colonize the caribbean so they're in uh cuba they're in jamaica uh they're in the dominican republic they're in haiti you know hispaniola um and they're beginning to kind of familiarize themselves um with the caribbean at this time so this is from 1492 uh until 1521 i think cortez goes I don't think he goes against the order of the Spanish crown, but he wasn't really authorized to invade um, Mexico. But, you know, it takes a long time for orders to get across the Atlantic Ocean and back from from Spain. So he kind of just takes it upon himself to uh, I think he lands in the beaches of uh, man, Tabasco or Veracruz, I think. And uh, and he essentially or it could have been it could have been in, in Merida. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um and then over, you know, over the next uh, two or three years, they completely conquer Mexico. But here's what was happening when they were going through um, Mexico on their march from the Maya world all the way to all the way to the Aztec uh, heartland, uh, you know, Tenochtitlan, which today would be modern day Mexico City. They were seeing that these people were already of a sickly nature. So they thought that they thought that who they were looking, they thought that these people were like kind of weak anyways, because there's disease everywhere. And, you know, why is that? Well, the reason was there were explorers and trading uh, European trading caravans that were moving around um, the Caribbean and they were exploring and trying to trade with people along the coast of the Yucatan. Well, when they were doing that, 
they were bringing over plagues from Spain and slowly, you know, exposing these people um, across the Yucatan. So this is probably, I think the first time this happens is roughly 1513 uh, that these trading caravans are coming from Hispaniola. And so from 1513 to 1521, you know, that's what, eight years, this disease is slowly moving from the Yucatan, from the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, all the way through the Maya world up to Tenochtitlan, slowly crawling in. You know, if you look at that desert, the Chihuahuan Desert, um, there's only a few parts of, of green that move off closer towards the coast. And there, there weren't as many people living um, in those areas. So the disease is kind of slowly crawling up into North America. It takes a, it takes a much longer time then it takes for disease to get from the coast of, uh, let's say the Yucatan as it goes down into Belize. Some of these cities in Belize that were populated at the time are completely depopulated by the time that the Spanish get there. And then it goes down into Honduras through Nicaragua, all the way down, uh, you know, through trading caravans that come up from the Amazon and Peru all the way up into Mexico. Um, there are also sailors that are trading from, um, Trading from northwestern South America, so uh, let's say northern Peru, uh, like the Moche cultures, um, Mo Moche cultures to Ecuador to Colombia. You have these trading caravans that are sailing along that coast, taking things to western Mexico, and so you have this giant web of trade. I mean, millions and millions and millions and millions of people. You know, 20 million people alone living in the Amazon, just the Amazon uh, at, at the very least. And so this disease is, is slowly and then more and more rapidly spreading through the Americas. So by the time that the Spanish actually show up, the whole place is, is decimated. Like, like the disease is leaping bounds in front of uh, European uh, armies. So, you know, all the, you know, all the edges have been worn off of these Native American uh, cities by the time the Europeans get there and the Europeans slaughter the rest of them. Like um, in 15, 1532, um, uh, in 1532, Pizarro arrives in Peru and the, um, the Inca emperor he is already dying of a disease by the time by the time he gets there, and then I think his son Alta Atahualpa um, becomes emperor. But that that Peruvian emperor who was the father, um, he was already dying of European disease. We think we're pretty sure of um, by the time that Pizarro got there. And so here's the thing: nobody had been there yet. So that disease entered. Meso, entered Mesoamerica and came all the way down through Central America through trade routes in the Amazon, all the way to the to the emperor of Peru over the course of 20 some odd years. And so, you know, that that was that was how the uh, that was how the Americas were decimated. So by the time explorers, you know, um, let's say Oriana, he's going down the Amazon. Well, at this time, uh, I think he's going down the Amazon, what, the 1530s, late 1520s. And um, I could be wrong about that, but he's going down the Amazon. He's seeing these massive cities by the time he starts hitting bedrock, because in the Western Amazon, it's all clay. So by the time he starts hitting bedrock, there are these stone cities that he reports that have these huge walls and everything. Um, well, his interaction with these, uh, his interaction with these natives um exposed them to, to disease. And by the time more European explorers came hundreds of years later, all of these civilizations were gone and the jungle had completely covered them all up. And now they're sitting underneath, who knows, 10, 10 plus feet of soil today. So the disease was just leaping in front of, in front of the military in decimating these populations. Um, and so much so to, you know, a uh, hundred years later in, uh, when, when is the date of the first Thanksgiving? 1621, 1622. Is, is that about right? Um, you have, uh, you have Squanto. Um, his family was finally just was finally decimated by disease that had crawled its way up through those, uh, through those green areas in Eastern Mexico, all the way through the Mississippian civilizations, all the way up to what we say is modern day Massachusetts. And his family was killed, uh, his family was killed by disease and um, and he was killed by the same disease on the second Thanksgiving. Um, and so that's how all that's how 
they say over 100 million native americans were killed uh during the uh during the conquest because of uh european disease so that's that's the that's like the short sweeping history of the fall of the americas and that's pretty much well accepted like everybody sort of accepts that as uh that's um, the reality, <clears throat> even, yeah. though it's, even though there's this big fight against germ theory right now and, and terrain theory, it's like, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's the, um, that's the accepted theory. Um, but it was, it really, it wasn't just one disease. So, um, I think, I think a simple way to put it, um, and, and I'm not really, I, you know, I don't really have a dog in this fight. I, you know, I don't get wrapped up in, in this necessarily, but, um, I think that, kind of diving into why the diseases took them out is because, okay, so you got to think Europeans, um, let's, let's rewind to 200 BC in Rome. Okay. So we Western society, we can largely trace our roots back to Rome, right? Um, Rome is kind of the, it's kind of, well, it's even Greece, but more so Rome, um, is the root of our Western society. So people are walking around Rome in literal filth. It is it, it was a disgusting city, um, you know, even with how prestigious it was and how magnificent the buildings were. It was a dis- disgusting city with cram streets, with a million people hustling and bustling through the cities every day and people living on the fifth floor, taking their, you know, their buckets of, of refuse, throwing it over the balcony into the street. So people are walking in poop, rat infested filth every single day of their life. Okay. Horses. I mean, how much poop just from the horses? Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. I mean, just, it, just try to imagine how disgusting it was. There were, there were so many people that came from around the classical world to Rome that were appalled at how disgusting this place was. And that's just one example of, you know, what a lot of different cities were like. And so you go to the medieval times and it's better, but it's not that much better. And, you know, you have these plagues that, uh, you know, it's theorized that the, uh, it's theorized that the bubonic plague um, or the black plague actually began along the Nile, like pre 300 BC, um, the rats that lived along the Nile river, because there was bubonic plague in ancient Egypt. So you have these horrific plagues that are, you know, spreading across the, the classical world um, and affecting the Mediterranean world for man, 4,000 years ish, give or take. And it's, you know, constantly becoming more and more of a thing. But, um, but Europeans, you know, they developed this really, really, and really people all over the classical world, like, you know, let's say Northern Africans over to, uh, you know, over to the Egyptians, still Northern Africans, um, into India, the Middle East, Greece, Rome, uh, all the way over to Spain, you know, and, and even the greater areas, uh, where the quote unquote barbarians lived you know, in, in more Northern Europe, these people are developing these really robust immune systems that come from these, you know, that are developed from being exposed to diseases that come from these disgusting cities. Okay. So that's thousands of years of immunity built up to diseases and people just because your disease can, just because your immune system can fight off a disease doesn't mean you're not a carrier of those germs. Right. And so a lot of these, a lot of these diseases that came from Asia and Africa that Europeans were carrying the germs of, but it wasn't attacking them. They exposed them to populations of people who had never, ever had any experience with diseases that bad. And it wasn't just one disease. It was like, um, I think it, I think it's like 25 different diseases that they theorize. It was like wave after wave, after wave, after wave, after wave, after wave, after wave over the course of, um, 120 some odd years that was just taking them out, taking them out, taking them out. And another theory is that they thought that these were bad spirits that were plaguing these cities. So these people would move from the city and go to the nearby cities and then, and then spread the disease there and then spread the disease there. So that's kind of the theory. And it makes sense to me, although I haven't really, uh, I haven't really researched it to try to prove myself wrong about that. But, um, you know, it sounds, uh, I, I'm not familiar with the with the um, with, with the, the controversy over over the, yeah, over the germ yeah, theory right now, yeah. but um, you know, I mean, I could be wrong. Anybody could be wrong about anything, but that's that's sort of the traditional idea of of how it happened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what uh, Darren? Where do you want to go here? I want to talk about the eclipse, uh, what the presentation, and um, 
you know, maybe other sort of megalithic stuff, maybe other theories about uh, sure some of the pyramids and the buildings in, in like how old they are in these areas that you're talking about. Like, mm-hmm. do they have megalithic roots or where do you want to go, Darren? That sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, All of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, to touch on the, uh, to touch on the eclipse, um, what is the exact date of that? It goes April, uh, April 8th, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something along those lines. I'm, I'm uh, getting the, the dates mixed up right now. Um, look, could, could we look that up and, and so that we know April, the exact April, date? April 8th. Okay. Okay. So April 8th, so April 8th, April 8th yeah. And the April event 8th, 6th to the 9th. Yeah. It's, it's the, uh, it's the total eclipse is going to be coming over, um, central central texas which is where i live in san antonio snake bros uh aren't very far away from me um and so we're going to be having the uh, we're going to be having the eclipse uh, kind of a camp out in utopia texas and um and so i'm going to be giving a presentation during that time and i think i think my presentation is going to be called feeding the gods and uh oh, and it's like going it. to be it's going to be over human sacrifice Oh, I like it. Nice. During, during the time of during the or ancient human sacrifice, the history of that um, during solar and lunar eclipses. Um, so that's going to be uh, that's going to practice my... one. Or are we going to do one like in, in yeah, the man. eclipse? I've I mean... got the obsidian blade ready. I've got I've got, a, you know, a willing sacrifice ready. Um, you know, I've never stabbed somebody's sternum and ripped their sternum in half and pulled their beating heart out. But it's going to be a terrific time. Uh, and, uh, and after that, we're going to be able to, uh, there's going to be comedians. We're going to get to, uh, listen to live music, uh, $50 dynasty is going to play. Uh, there's going to be vendors there. It's, it's really going to be a fun weekend. Like, I, I'm really, really, this is going to be one of my favorite events of the year. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Um, so, so besides the obsidian blade, give us a tease about, about what your presentation is going to be about. Like the, is it going to be about all those areas and and the feeding of the gods, like the difference between some of those, those areas, the Maya, the Inca. The yeah. Aztec, yeah. Or... So it's going to be, um, I think, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to expand it beyond just, uh, beyond just the Americas, but yeah, I'm going to do a breakdown of human sacrifice in area in different areas around the world. So it'll are be, you, are you going to get into modern ones? Like, uh, the God, the scientism God, there's some sacrifices going on these days. Like, can you touch that <laughs> subject? At all? Um, uh, I mean, there might actually be more. Like, if you look at like at a total quantity, we might oh, be sacrificing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, I These think that there are probably. Cultures. Yeah, I think that there are probably. Uh, it's a little dark, uh, <laughs> very, very dark. But I think that there are probably a lot more children um, going missing and and uh, being sacrificed today than there ever have been. Um, I'm pretty sure that that I'm pretty sure that's actually a fact. Um, at least that more children are going missing than ever have been. And uh, it's amazing that more people don't talk about that, but if, yeah, it's it. that's why I'm just kind of joking about it. Yeah, yeah, I've been no, thinking no. about, I've been thinking about the comparison, like these, you know, on the altars for the gods or the weather gods or whatever that their sacrifices that you're going to talk about. It's interesting how the people are like, Oh yeah, they used to sacrifice kids. And then you look at what's going on today and they're like, well, uh, are we doing any better really overall? It's an yeah, yeah. well, interesting it, way to look at things, you know? Yeah, well, um, I don't normally get political, but but I will say it's amazing that the United States doesn't do anything about like the uh, the border crisis right now when at the very least you would think that they would do something about it because last year 30,000 migrant children were taken from their families and are currently missing. 30,000 wow, children have gone missing because of that. That's so, a lot of, yeah. Yeah. For that fact alone, you would think that the U S because they act like they care about, you know, everybody so much that they would step in and, and uh, you know, do something to try to find where 30,000 children went. Yeah. Um, but as, uh, aside from that, um, I those, probably, well, those are actual kids missing because everyone talks about the 800,000 missing kids a year. And then you look into that mm-hmm. and it's like 99% of those kids end up back at the things, but these are 30,000 yeah. kids that are just fucking gone, not coming back, not returned to anyone. No one even knows there's no one to go looking for them. Yep. Yeah. It, it's, it's, um, man, that's, that's really freaking scary. Um, but for the most part, man, I, I try to stay out of like modern politics. Like I try to keep my page and, and everything like in escape from the modern day. Um, but there's certainly a lot of things that you see in the ancient world. You're like, Hmm, 
I'm seeing that today. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and, uh, but as far as my presentation, no, I, I won't talk about anything that that's modern. Um, I'll probably talk about, uh, you know, I'll talk about the Aztecs sacrificing people on solar and lunar eclipses and being able to, and the Maya too, being able to anticipate the eclipse and then, you know, have a ritual sacrifice uh, happening then. And that'll be a highlight of my presentation, but I'll also talk about, you know, in South America, um, then sending people up to, basically freeze to death on top of these mountains you know how they found these mummies of people that are just sitting on a mountain that have been frozen there for 600 years or a thousand years um and then i'll also talk about human sacrifice in ancient greece and rome um and you know that's not very well known uh, i'll probably talk about uh I'll probably talk about crucifixion a little bit. You know, it's it's going to be a pretty it's going to be a pretty dark, gruesome. I love it. That's great. But I but I think it's going to be I think it's going to be fascinating. You know, and I'm going to get into all the horrible ways that you know people were sacrificed. Like, have you guys ever heard of of the uh, the brass or the golden bull before? The brass. Uh, yes, yes. Sure yes. Brass put people in yeah, like, on fire when they, when they light it on fire. Yeah, put yeah, yeah. So they so they'd, put, they'd put you inside the bull. And, uh, and it's theorized that there was a horn that would go through the bulls, like out of the bull's mouth so you could breathe. But when you were breathing or screaming, it would sound like the cow was mooing, you know? And so they light the, they put you inside this gold bull. I don't know if it was gold or if it was brass. Um, and then they I would, think it was you know, brass. I feel like it was brass. I think it's the brass bull. Yeah. And they would, they would, uh, you know, put timbers underneath it and light it on fire. So you're just cooking alive inside of this bull and when you're screaming there's a horn coming out of the bull's mouth that, say, that makes it sound like the bull is is mooing you know um so I, i'm gonna get into all that horrific stuff um i think that's gonna be a really fun presentation i've never quite done anything like that um so that'll be uh that'll be um yeah that'll be that'll be my presentation for the event it's gonna it's gonna be a great event um as far as the uh, as far as the megaliths, what what were the uh, the questions you had there? Well, I guess it's hard to imagine thousands, tens of thousands of pyramids, you know. And uh, we've seen different layers of this megalithic building, where the it seems like even the ones that we would consider old are from the uh, from the Egyptian dy dynasties, for example. But yep. does that sort of like, and and also in South America, so. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's similar stuff in South America where there's these oh, yeah. these layers of buildings. So they've built upon megalithic blocks, and they've you can see the different sort of um, oh yeah the different timelines. Is yeah, that yeah. also happen in Central America and Mexico as well? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So where I there's think like megalithic yeah. bases in a way. Yeah, exactly. So I think most people get the point um, uh, about South America. You know, there's all these different sites, um, these yeah, yeah. quote unquote Inca sites in Peru. Um, you know, with these giant megalithic granite and, uh, and basalt structures. Um, I mean, just, just, I mean, blocks that are, that are just, that dwarf the size of, of any blocks used in Egypt, you know, just, just absolutely enormous. Um, so I think, I think most people, uh, you know, have, have heard that a, a million times. Now, what's interesting and what I'm going to push my research further into in uh, Central America, now that I have gotten a good uh, point of view uh, or n now that I kind of understand, I've traveled around Central America and Mexico enough um, that I'm kind of understanding it. And I'm going to do Guatemala this year. So um, once I do Guatemala and Belize, it will kind of complete my tour of, of seeing the majority of, of, uh, of the Mesoamerican sites that are in the jungle. Right. Um, so what's really interesting is there is a, a very similar mystery in the Maya world there's a very similar mystery in the Maya world that we see in ancient Egypt, where when you go back to the beginning of ancient Egypt, you see many of the most uh, spectacular sites that that the Egyptians ever created. And it happens right at the beginning. Um, the exact same thing happens in the Maya world. So uh, one of the oldest cities in the Maya world is called El Mirador. So do you see do you see above Flores in Guatemala? Do you see the Reserva de uh, Biosphera Maya. Yep. So at the top left of this jungle, um, you see uh, Isabelita. You see yep. down there? So go go a bit north of that. Okay. Um, and then do you see, I can't really read it. What's the word that starts with a P? 
Um, uh, just, Pax, Pax Bon or Pax yeah, bon? Yeah, yeah. Somewhere near there, it could be a little bit more east of there, uh, is going to be the city of El Mirador, which is, a, I think it's a three-day walk through the jungle to get there, um, unless you want to take, yeah, the Mirador Basin. Yeah, yeah there you yeah. go. Um, so that is the site of El Mirador and Nak Bay, which are the two two of the oldest major cities in the Maya world. And uh, and you got you know as a normal person, if you can't afford a, a helicopter to fly you there, you've got to walk for three days to get there and three days to get back, um, which is something I plan to do probably twenty twenty five. Um, now the reports here come from a guy named. Uh, Richard Hansen. What kind of shit's gonna try and eat you when you're walking in that jungle, Luke Caverns? Are we talking like snakes? Oh yeah, you're in the I middle mean, of nowhere there. Like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit. I mean, that's the kind of shit that freaks me out about going down to Mexico and wandering through the Yucatan Peninsula. It sounds awesome, but I'm worried about like actual savages and like you know, like what's the and cartel and all that kind of stuff. What's the vibe like for just general safety? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's probably because you're not on the resort. You're like in the shit. Like, you know what I mean? You're yeah, yeah, exactly. In the jungle, dude. You know, if you disappear, no one ever is gonna know what what happened. Like, were yeah. you doing that kind of shit already when you were down there? Are you like in the middle of nowhere? Like, um, most of the time, I just do day excursions. I go out for a day and I come back. Um, only f- the I o- I've only stayed overnight in the jungle, um, one time, uh, for one night. Uh, I haven't done like full on expeditions where I'm sleeping on the ground. Um, that's pretty damn dangerous, to be honest with you, um, because the fertilant snake, you know, you get bit by a fertilant snake a day out into the jungle and you're not coming out of the jungle, but you're going to die. Um, and so it's it's pretty dangerous. And and I'm I'm pretty uh, reckless, um, but I'm I'm not quite that reckless yet. Um, I haven't I haven't built up that kind of fear tolerance yet. Um what about so, even just the renting a car and doing day trips into the jungle and, and this, cause this isn't like, there's not a ton of, res- like, are you going from a resort or you're just, sounds like you're just going from a hotel in a small town sort of thing. Um, yeah, not even a hotel, man, like sleeping in the back of someone's house, like in, like in an available room or something. I mean, that's, that's how, that's how small the towns get, you know, they have a little Airbnb or something like that. And, uh, and you rent that out and you're staying, um, I was staying in the back of a pizzeria when I was there, you know, we, we would, there's a pizza shop and there's like a couple of rooms in the back and that's where we were staying. Um, and so we would drive for a couple hours to get to a site, get out, walk around all day long from sun, from sun up to sundown. Oh my God. And, uh, and really, really the main, oh man, it, it was, it, it's pretty dangerous because, um, heat stroke gets you really easy, easily. And I never thought that I would be a victim of heat stroke until I got it the last trip um, that I was there. And it just sneaks up on you, man. Like you're just working your ass off, you know, trying to see everything you can and document everything you can. And, uh, and it's really easy to forget to drink water. And as you become more and more dehydrated, you reach a point where you're not thirsty anymore. And it's just a, it's a slippery slope beyond that point. Um, so, so for so for example, this El Mirador here on the map. Uh, so there's the Pyramid of the Jaguar there. There's the Monos Pyramid right close yep. by. Leon, the Pyramid of the Tiger. Yep. So you yeah, go to yeah. all those kind of. You'll do like a little trip to all those. Yeah, yeah. So that's so that's all one city, um, and uh, and those are your biggest cities in the Maya world. Now Richard Hansen, I think that he's kind of the overlord of that site. He's been working on that site for decades now. That's a, see, that's a that's a reservoir. I'm pretty sure. So yeah. massive reservoirs with fresh water. That's where they, you know, if we were to be, drop a helicopter down and, and go down on a rope, there would absolutely be pyramids uh, around that reservoir. Have literally no doubt about it. If you want to find a lost city in the Maya world, look on a look on a satellite image and find a reservoir and just go there. And you I mean, look at this temple city. right there. You can tell it's 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 a it's a pyramid shaped yep. temple, even yeah, from yeah. Google Maps. Like, yeah, yeah. So that's Ladonta. Okay, you want to know something really crazy about that? Zoom in. Do you see? Put your cursor on where you think that the bottom of the pyramid is. Right there. Okay. No, go more. That that look look at where my right hands there. are. That's look at right. Where my hands are. Yeah, yeah. So so here's the pyramid. It yep. goes it goes up. There's going to be a flat part 
And on the top of this flat part, there's going to be three more pyramids. What you're seeing is just one of those pyramids. Wow. So yeah. it's like this whole, this whole thing is a pyramid. Oh, it's you that, know what? You can see the that. different colors of the trees. If you back out a little bit, you can see like this. That's outline, how, right? That's how big they are. There it is. Look at that's that. That's how big they are. And the base of that, this is what's so amazing. The base of that pyramid, you're not finding, you're not finding pictures of it online. You're just not. It's just too obscure of a site. Um, but what I have heard is that the base of that pyramid is constructed out of the biggest blocks used in a pyramid anywhere in the Maya world. Huge, huge multi-ton. Uh, I, I've heard it said between um, between ten and or between uh, two and ten tons, which is you know that's the size of the of the limestone blocks on the Great Pyramid. Um, you know, two and ten tons out of limestone is a block that's like. I don't sometimes four feet tall by four or five feet long and you know, a few feet thick or something. I mean, massive blocks. Um, and this is one of the first major sites in the Maya world, uh, that dates back to, you know, two to 300 BC, um, this and Nakbe as well. So El Mirador and Nakbe. And so the foundations of those cities are built out of the biggest blocks seen anywhere in the Maya world. Um, wow. and is there the any evidence? Is, Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and I was going to say, and the thing is, it's just not documented. Like I am going to have to be, and there's nobody else that's going to do it. I'm going to have to be the guy to walk for three days to get out there just to take a damn photo of it because you can't find these photos anywhere, anywhere. You know, when people go to El Mirador, when people go to El Mirador, they walk to the top to get a, to get the aerial photo. I'm going to be walking off to the side of the archeological site to take a photo of the giant blocks that make up the base of the pyramid. Um, because every, the other time you're there, you're seeing the frescoes, you're seeing the murals that are there. Um, and, and, and that place has some of the most intricate murals um, of anywhere in the Maya world. And another thing about that is they're so proportional and so expertly made in 200 BC. Like it, there was nobody who was, who was born at that time. And the concept of these, masterful pieces of artwork didn't exist and they just came up with it. You know, this is generations of generations of generations of generations of artistry and, uh, you know, architectural engineering to be able to, to make things this big. Do so you think this, do you think this goes back then like similar to these discussions about pre younger driest megalithic building before, you know, re the restart well, I, of civilization after the big cataclysms? I wanted to add to that if he, if it went up north before that, if it was part of something bigger before that, even. Now, what do you mean went up north? Well, it seems like the it, it all starts at the line, kind of where the mm -hmm. younger Dryas fallout ends. So, you mm -hmm. know, was it there before? Was it, you know, was there... How far did it go up to, you know, the top well, half of Texas or even for, further before it got wiped the fuck out? For mm -hmm. example, look at this blue line here, right? Yeah. I mean, look that at that, right? So pre, pre Younger Dryas, this whole thing might have been un uncovered, right? I mean, that might have been all dry before the melting yeah, well, what of the Great what, 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 what do they say that sea levels were, what, 400, Four, feet, 400 lower? feet? 400 feet. Right? Yeah. Hey, so, dude, dude, when we talked to Old World Florida, didn't he say that that was pretty much a lake? The Gulf of Mexico was a lake at that time. It was mm -hmm. like it was so the yeah, Yucatan it was dead, like, was like this here, right? Like this. Almost. Yeah. 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 Um. So it's hard. It's hard to say, right? Because um, we don't have you know we don't have pyramids with with biological remains that that we haven't found or documented or or the information is not available to us of pyramids that you know can have biological material of some kind that date back to 12 to 1200 or uh, 12000 BC another thing to think about is that this is a jungle and pyramids that are just 600 years old are almost unidentifiable when you're standing right next to them. I was going to so, ask you about that. How long does it take to overgrow that much? Um, okay. So I have, I have a perfect story. Um, so uh, about 13 months ago, I was in the jungles of Chiapas um, just outside of Palenque. And I see this hole in the ground. Um, and there's a, there's a hole in the ground and I can tell that it's like, um, I, I can tell that it's like an underground chamber. Um, 
uh, let's see, Palenque. Uh, it's it's there somewhere. I think it's a little bit more north of that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's in there somewhere. Um, but uh, I see this hole in the ground, and I can tell that it's it's like a subterranean chamber that 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 the Maya had built to to go underground. So I jump down inside of it. I take a video of everything, and it's like a it's like a it's like an archway on the inside. You know, it's a flat it's a flat perfectly flat floor, perfectly flat complete stone walls some of the biggest stones i've ever seen i mean i've got to go back and i've got to jump back in that hole and, and take more photos of it um and it's got an arched you know trapezoidal roof and i thought like wow this is amazing i'm in a subterranean chamber this is probably you know maybe it was a tomb of some kind or something well i get back and gosh i've got a i've got a book here somewhere yep <clears throat> I've got this book that is a uh, function and meaning in classic Maya architecture. And uh, somewhere in this book, maybe I could just flip to it and show you. Um, it breaks down the construction of, of arched corable roofs in the Maya world. And I end up reading more and more about it because I had seen it in this underground chamber, this hole that I jumped inside. Um, it was exactly like that actually. Wow. Except there was a hole it was enclosed. So to say there was a fourth wall here and I jumped down inside of this chamber and I was standing inside of it. And while I was studying, I, I ended up realizing, oh, this wasn't a subterranean chamber because they didn't build subterranean chambers like this. This was once above the ground. And now <laughs> it's and I jumped into the roof of a I jumped into the roof of a uh 30 foot 30 foot tall uh, well 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 what i'm trying to say is how old it was so i jumped into the i jumped into the roof of a 13 1400 year old temple that was once above the ground but now the ground was level with the roof and i was able in the roof had collapsed in so i jumped in so i mean just think about that that's 1300 years and it's covered up I mean, I don't know. I don't know how, how big exactly that temple was. I need to go back out there and see that. Um, now that's Chichen Itza, the temple of yeah. Kukulkan. And, and I mean, that it's almost, a bit farther North too, right? Where it seems, I mean, it was pretty jungly there too, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Much, shows what that looked like compared to, I think at the top, it shows what it looks like now. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and the pyramid of Kukulkan is, uh, you know, it was probably, uh, abandoned in the mid 1500s ish. So that's 450. You know, that's, that's 300 years is what it took to look like that picture. You know what I mean? So it's almost being a thousand. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. By a thousand, by a thousand, it's, it's a hill, you know, um, when the Aztecs arrived in the city of Teotihuacan, think about how big those pyramids were or those pyramids are. And you can go, you can look up, you can look up photos of, of those pyramids before they were um, excavated. And they look like, they look like giant hills. And the Aztecs at first, they just thought that they were massive hills. And then they ended up realizing that, Oh my God, these are buildings that are, you know, extremely old. I mean, man, just imagine like the, just imagine the, the, the mindset of an Aztec person discovering Teotihuacan, the biggest pyramids in the Mesoamerican world. And you're walking up to these very strange looking hills that are sitting in this flat area and you walk up to it. And the closer you get, you realize that is a building that is covered up by the soil. I mean, just imagine how mythical that would seem to them from the civilization that had, that was around a thousand. I mean, they didn't even really know how long ago, um, how long ago it was built. So when you're in the jungle, it's even more dramatic, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so what's your, what's your gut feeling? I mean, total speculation here that mm. is it part of a global megalithic, like pre, pre, pre cataclysm. So, you know? okay. So we have, um, we have North American mound sites that go back what 9,000 BC. Is that right? Um, or, or we have some that go back like 12,000 years, something along that, something along those lines. Like, I mean, we have mound sites in Louisiana that go back to roughly the time of the younger Dryas. Uh, my friend, John would know that. Um, and we, we have 100% evidence that the Maya people were around 20,000 years ago living in caves. Um, and we have evidence, we have evidence of their habitation in these, uh, 
in these, uh, you know, I guess, uh, in these huge caves, uh, like Lultun Cave, there's there's evidence of Maya people living there for twenty thousand years. Um, as far as the, they were probably building at least earthen mound structures twelve thousand years ago. I mean, I, I would guess, I would guess that they definitely were stone structures. It's hard to say, you know, they they get they get covered up so easily, and so do mound structures. I mean, gosh, um, I, but I don't have any doubt that Maya people twelve thousand years ago were building something of some kind, whether they were connected all the way across the world. That's a tough thing. Like I, I cast a weary eye on that because it, it's, man, it's, it's like your gut tells you, you see so many similarities across the ancient world. Um, and you see so many similar mysteries. Like, you know, the most obvious way to put it is look at the, look at the just bizarre architecture that's made in South America. You know, you see these strange like scoop marks and you see the way that it's almost like they fuse these granite basalt blocks onto one another. Um, this cyclopean style of, of granite uh, stonework that you see in South America, you see literally the same thing on, on the pyramid of, of Minkare. And it's like your gut tells you that there's some kind of connection there. I mean, how likely is it that that is just coincidence? Um, but man, it's it's a it's a tough thing to it's a tough thing to prove, you know. Well, well, well. You brought up I, I saw a little bit of your your show on the Brothers of the Serpent there when you were there, and you did bring up the bag. What's in the bag? That whole meme, right? The bag, and yeah, that yeah. Was, wasn't no, that you're, from you're, was you're it not from the Maya too though? Uh, the Olmecs. The, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. the Olmecs. So, okay. so the Olmecs. Um, so the Olmecs. I mean, dude, that's that's the biggest mystery. I mean, that's that's the elephant in the room for uh, for Mesoamerica. I mean, there's. Is that Oh, that's Meso still? Olmec? Yeah, that's Mesoamerica. Okay. So that's that's Tabasco. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so the uh I forget it's like Monument 16 or Monument 19 um of uh of of the city of Laventa, I believe. And so it depicts now this is what's really weird. So Kukul Khan, which is the feathered serpent, this it's the same, it's just a different word for Quetzalcoatl. Um and, or some people call it Quetzalcoatl. Uh, yeah, but the L, the L, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's the it's the same, you know, mythical being. And what's interesting is that Olmec monument. I mean, aesthetically, it's perfect. I mean, it's just it's so pleasing to look at. It took a it took a masterful artist to construct that thing, and yet it's the earliest depiction of Quetzalcoatl that we have, and it's an incredible piece of artwork. That is actually carved in the same hieroglyphic. I don't know if hieroglyphic is the right style, but the same kind of uh, carving statuette style of uh, of Gobekli Tepe, where the face of the block the is removed. The bas relief. Sort of? Yes. Yeah. 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 Where where the face of the block is removed to reveal the image from underneath. You know what I mean? It's not just like the Egyptians chiseling in and, and chiseling hieroglyphics into limestone, right? Uh, that would be a lot more easy than chipping away the face of a stone to reveal something from underneath, right? And the Olmecs, I mean, their their stonework is is more impressive than what we see at Gobekli Tepe it, on in harder stone in the, in the exact same style. And the very first time that we see Quetzalcoatl, this feathered serpent god depicted, it's like the artistry is perfect. And it's almost like he's carrying this Olmec um, you know, I don't know, this Olmec figure of some kind. And what does that Olmec figure have in his hand is some kind of bag. It's absolutely bizarre. And we see it, you know, we see the depiction of that very similarly on, on uh, one of the uh, stele at Gobekli Tepe. And then we see it also in um, somewhere in, Mes in Mesopotamia. I think it's Syria or, or something. He, he, I think Easter Island too, even. I'm not sure, but. I thought it was in Easter. Island. I, I thought I it was in it, multiple. I thought it was in like four or five different places. Yeah, I, I think may, I might be wrong. I think there's something in Easter Island that they speculate is similar to that. Um, but man, I mean, you look at that, and it's like your instant, uh, your instant inclination is to think that there's some kind of connection there. Um, and it's like in some ways, my gut tells me that, but then there's other ways where I try to like really think about it, and there's just so many different. Um, there's so many different things that that come to my mind. And I'm like, I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know, man. It's a, it's a huge, huge mystery. My gut tells me there's some kind of connection there. 
Um, but to prove that, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it's an insurmountable feat to be able to prove that, you know, um, it, it, it's kind of one of the things where I've heard, um, <laughs> I don't know, a, a semi-logical argument is like, um, you know, is it just one of those things where humans all across the world just happen to do similar things because ants all across the world all build similar ant mounds? You know, are we just destined to connect? To the con there's yeah, a collective yeah. con there's a collective unconscious to us too, right? I mean, there's the inventors invent things, um, different parts of the world at the same yeah. time. I mean, it could be like it could be a consciousness thing. Here, here's here's something that I here's something that I would say, and, and I'm real. Um, I'm real. I'm open to every mystery, every theory. I'm never going to shoot anything down. I don't necessarily, you know, subscribe to every theory. Like, uh, you know, I've got all of Graham Hancock's books on my shelf here. Um, and while when I get to the end of the book, I may not agree with all of his, you know, conclusions or his speculations or anything. Um, I may not agree with all of them, but I mean, the book just opens my mind up to so many different things. I didn't know who the Olmecs were before I read Fingerprints of the Gods when I was like 17. Um, and so, you know, that was nine years ago. Um, and so, you know, being open to so many different theories has, has opened my mind up to so many other possibilities that I used to kind of weave into my own theories. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, you know, with, with a lot of certainty, exactly the way things were, I, I really don't, you know, uh, definitively say many things at all, because I mean, at the end of the day, I, we all have, things have changed so much too. I mean, everything yeah, changed, yeah. seems to change. I mean, all these sort of scientific facts seem to be shifting with the ages anyways, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, every, everything is changing so quickly. Um, you know, I mean, you even look at, you even look at what the, uh, I think that the biggest, I think that one of the biggest things that, that is probably going to change, um, some of the narratives. So I'll tell I'll tell you guys in, in Egypt where I fall, is uh, I, I saw somebody somebody commented this on my Twitter, and uh, and um, and I agree with this that somebody was like somebody was like I think that the argument isn't so much timeline as technology, because I fall somewhere in the realm of, I definitely believe that there are lost forms of technology and techniques that the Egyptians were using. Um, I don't see the need for a entirely lost like a Atlantean civilization. Um, needed to explain a lot of the Egyptian sites. I think that the Egyptians themselves were privy to forms of technology that were lost even after the time of the old kingdom. I mean, the old kingdom falls apart for 300 years and I mean, we go down this whole rabbit hole. Let's go down this whole rabbit hole on, on a future episode as well. But um, yeah, you know, because I, I would I argue that at, uh, oh fuck, I'm going to forget the name of it now at uh, Kuf, what's the one Graham? Uh, starts with a K. Karnak, at Karnak, that whole that whole thing is built around gl granite blocks mm -hmm. that the geologist in our group said you're looking at twenty or thirty thousand years of this block being exposed here for it to be weathered the way it is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um. Yeah. I think I think that there's a whole. Um. I think there's a whole. Obviously, a whole web of mystery. Um. There. The way that. The way I see it is I think that it's more of a uh, I think that the mystery is more of technology than timeline. Um, I think that and I mean, this would be a whole like two hour, you know, conversation. Um, but I think that I think that definitely Egyptian history um, and as far as what they were capable of, obviously with the vases, it's showing that it goes back further than than you know previously imagined like you know we don't even have the we don't even have the lathe um oh wow nice that Very may or may not have been smuggled out from underneath the the bent pyramid oh my gosh as but an anthropologist I I can't condone that, but, but it's cool uh, so. well, i'll uh i'll bring it with me when yeah yeah you, and i'll show you like if you bring any sort of you don't even need just a microscope and you can see very clear tool marks on this thing it's it's like when i look at it here i can even see part of it with my naked eye that there's no way someone like did this with a copper chisel it's just yeah it's yeah I, I think i think that there's i think there's absolutely a um uh there, there's absolutely a form of of lost technology you know at play here that's that's honestly amazing um and so you know at the simplest explanation 
the the existence of the lathe goes back over a thousand years. And, and I mean, but the type of lathe to be able to 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 make vases like this, even that isn't a good enough explanation, you know? So there's, there's definitely forms of, of different types of, of, I would call them lost technologies, um, that I think that the Egyptians were using. So when I see, you know, Graham and Randall and Ben, and a lot of these big players in this space, you know, talking about these mysteries, I entirely agree with the mystery that they're pointing out. I may not see the need for, you know, a lost Atlantean civilization to have done it because here's, here's the thing. Um, and, and this will really be better attributed to to a future episode, which we should definitely do. Yeah, but, yeah, sure. but the story comes from it. We can trace the story back to Plato, right? Um, in um, Plato, is, Plato is what? 300 BC or is he fourth? I think he, yeah, I think he's 300 BC. Uh, I think Herodotus is 450, um, and then and then Solon is what 600 BC. Um, so we can trace the story back to Plato, and Plato tells us about you know one of his effective ancestors. You know, maybe not he wasn't directly related to him. Uh, visited the site of uh, it's not Siwa, Egypt. I don't know why I'm blanking on the on the uh, on the name Mem- of it. Memphis. No, not Memphis. Is it? It's close. It's close to Memphis. It's not Siwa, Egypt. I've been studying Siwa lately, so I'm wanting to say that. Um, but man, what is the what is the name of the city that uh, that Solon visited? It begins with an S. But anyways, he's at the he visits uh, a priest in one of the temples there, and they essentially tell them of this. Uh, they essentially tell him of this predecessor civilization. Um, and in that story, he lists, he tells the, lo- he tells the location of, uh, of Atlantis. And it was beyond, it was beyond what the Greeks would have known as the gates of Hercules, which is the Strait of Gibraltar. You know, they, they list the actual, um, the actual site of the city of Atlantis. Now, does that mean that there, that there weren't Egyptian monuments around at that time? No, that's not what it means. Um, but it's just, it's um it's a trivial thing to Egypt gets wrapped up in the Atlantis story, but I don't think it necessarily needs to be um, because it's not actually listed in the in the Atlantis story. It just happens to be a story that supposedly, you know, comes out of Egypt. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, I have some disagreements there. But at the end of the day, man, I mean, it's uh, I, I really do agree with with the vast majority of the mysteries that are brought up about Egypt. And the mysteries stand alone. You know what I mean? Regardless of regardless of who did it at what time, the mystery is still there because it shouldn't. Uh, a lot of these mysteries are still inexplicable. So for me, it's more of a a matter of of technology than time. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, Shweta in the chat says Solon visited Neith's Temple of Sais. Safe Egypt. Yep that that that's what it is. Yeah, I couldn't think of it because I've been saying the word uh, Siwa for. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. I've been studying yeah. Alexander. Um, so my my uh, my research right now is uh, what I'm working on right now is I'm working on a new series on YouTube um, called Alexandria, and uh, and so, you know everyone is fascinated by the Library of Alexandria, but there was a hell of a lot more going on in that city. I mean, a hell of a lot more. Like wow. Uh, it blows my mind. I've been studying this for quite a little while now, and I haven't. I, I've announced this like on some podcast, but not, not on my own. And I've got, um, I've got a couple dozen episodes um, written, and I've got outlines and concepts uh, laid out. But it's going to be not only the history, but it's going to be like you know analyzing the lost history, um, you know the buildings that were there, the megalithic structures that were there the lighthouse of Alexandria, the mausoleum of, of Alexander, uh, the museum, which not a lot of people know about was connected to the library. And that's where all the scientists, the Greek, sci- the Greek and Egyptian scientists were in Alexandria. And here's, what's really interesting. Uh, Eratosthenes, I believe that he's, he's a Greek philosopher, scientist. Um, you know, they call any like influential Greek, uh, character, they call them a philosopher, but they were, you know, a, a plethora of things. And I think it's Eratosthenes, that is attributed with um, he deciphered the circumference of the earth in the museum, which is connected to the library of Alexandria. Um, he, he figured out, he figured that out in uh, I think the mid third century, which is around 250 BC. I think I could be wrong about that. It might be 150 BC um, sometime around then, but um, that's not really that important. But um, 
what's really interesting is, and I'm going to be investigating this, I have a hunch about it, is um, the Egyptians definitely already knew at a previous time the circumference of the earth because yeah. it's coded into the pyramid. Yeah, and it's so coded in their yard too. Yep. And so here's what's really here's what's really interesting. After the old kingdom, if we're going along the traditional, you know, Egypt's logical timeline, after the old kingdom, we don't see these giant megalithic uh, blocks used in architecture anymore. And, you know, by the time the middle kingdom comes along, the middle kingdom was pretty modest. And then the new kingdom starts to get more monumental. Some of their statues are really massive, but the buildings and the temples just aren't made out of these megalithic stones anymore. So eventually Egypt is conquered by Persia for a long time. And Egypt is under the, is under the oppression of like these Persian Kings for, you know, centuries. And then all of a sudden Alexander comes along and, and scares the Persians out of Egypt. And he's welcomed as a liberator because he's going to give the culture back to Egypt. But, but in return, they're going to have to pay him with grain and food and, and, and feed his army. Right. And he's going to be able to station his uh, his troops there. So he builds the city of Alexandria, and then he continues on his conquests throughout Asia. Uh, he conquers Persia, and then he tries to move into India to complete his Macedonian trade network. Well, they leave India. He dies in ba- he dies in Babylon. When his body's being transported back to Macedonia, Greece, his friend who was really interested in Egypt. Um, he became satrap, which is governor of Egypt. So he was ruling over Egypt, uh, governing Egypt for the greater Macedonian empire. But he was a pretty ambitious guy and he really wanted to just be Pharaoh of Egypt. So he wanted to take Egypt away from the Macedonian empire that once belonged to his childhood friend. But to secure his place, you know, he didn't have, he wasn't Alexander the Great. He was just one of Alexander's like top guys, you know? So he didn't have this, legendary status about him that the Egyptians would accept. So he does a couple, he does a couple different things. He commissions these massive, huge building projects to bring honor to the Egyptians. Um, And I'll get to that in a second. But another thing he does is he sends his army to intercept Alexander's body while it's on its way back to Macedonia. And he takes Alexander's body back to Egypt takes him to Memphis at first and then moves his body to Alexandria and has him buried at the center crossway of the main streets in Alexandria. And so he basically says, look, I have Alexander's body with me. You know, I brought Alexander, the legendary conqueror and the founder of the city. I brought him back to Egypt and I am the, you know, I am the successor to Alexander's empire, uh, especially in Egypt. So he buries him. He builds this huge mausoleum like the biggest tomb ever constructed at the time you know maybe other than the pyramids or whatever if you want to say they're tombs um he constructs one of the biggest tombs ever and buries him at the at the center of alexandria and then he builds the pharos lighthouse which is the lighthouse of alexandria and he builds the library of alexandria to house all the world's knowledge and he builds the museum which is a scientific university like you know a university right next to the to the library And so over time, these earthquakes, you know, hit these earthquakes, you know, shake a lot of the buildings of Alexandria down. Um, And it took centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries. Uh, I think well over a thousand years for the lighthouse to be totally demolished and to fall down. Um, And it was also attacked by like, you know, the Christian era and the Islamic era. It It was taken down. But some of those blocks from the lighthouse spilled into the Alexandrian Harbor. And a lot of the other uh, monuments, ha- when they fall down, they've sunken into the Harbor and also the sea level, just like, you know, in a lot of other places in the world has risen since then and sunk in a lot of the, the palaces. And so dude, the blocks that Ptolemy used to construct these things in Alexandria are as big and bigger than some of the then a lot of the blocks used during the old kingdom. Oh. And so what I think that he was doing was to solidify his power as the new pharaoh, you know, as the first Greek pharaoh to get the Egyptians to 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 accept him. He goes and captures Alexander's body, says I'm the rightful heir, and he builds enormous monuments that call back to the most ancient, the most legendary golden days of Egyptian history. 
and build some of the buildest, biggest building projects in Egypt. And when he also creates the, 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 the library and the museum, I think that these guys, my hunch tells me that they were studying and bringing forward a lot of the knowledge they knew very, 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 very they distant yeah. Egypt to, they were bringing it back to, to, you know, their present day. And which, I think that, which might have something to do with why the library was, was destroyed or no. I mean, did do you talk about, do you get into maybe some of the books were absconded before the destruction? Um, so yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I'm really taking it like one step at a time. I, I'm trying, I'm trying to give, you know, over the course of this whole series, I'm trying to give, and I, the series is going to be like hundreds of episodes, you know, um, I'm, I'm giving a complete history of every single, I mean, literally every single aspect of the entire city. Um, well, I hope I didn't interrupt you then. Cause you were kind of going to say in the end, like they, yeah, stole, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they, they found the knowledge from the ancient, ancient past. And yeah. they were using that to to reestablish these these monuments. Yes, yes. So I I think I think that somehow, some way, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have to dig through the sources. Like I, I think I'm kind of one of the only people that is like privy to this. Um, and so you know, I hope nobody steals my idea. I will be pissed. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think that Alexandrian scholars were digging into these secrets of of the ancient past. Th- these were things that. Um, they were obviously, many of them were interested in, um, you know, I mean, Alexander, he loved Egypt and, and Ptolemy loved the mysteries of ancient Egypt, Herodotus, which predated them. He said it was a land filled, a land filled with wonders. Um, and so a lot of Greeks were, were really fascinated by Egypt. And so I think these Greco Egyptian scholars that worked in the library and the museum were, were re refiguring out a lot of the mysteries of how, you know, a lot of these sites were constructed. And they also, they also were, um, okay. So you know how, you know how the topic of some of Ben's videos are the just immaculate stone cutting and the, and the precision cutting of some of the, um, uh, of some of the granite statues, yeah. right? Okay. In the harbors of Alexandria, they have pulled out heads of Alexander made out of the exact same stone. Wow. With the exact, with the exact same like precision. Now, granted it's been sitting underwater and like rolling around on, on the Harbor. So it's a little bit more, these are a little bit more weathered because they've been down, right? submerged. Right. And, um, and, um, but made out of the same kind of, you know, extremely hard granite. And that's a tough thing to get around. So, that means that 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 know how that technology that expertise of of uh, I don't even know like stone cutting stone carving was around after the time of Alexander as well. So there's a lot of things pointing towards that Alexandria was really hearkening back to these ancient mysteries and, and this golden age of ancient Egypt and bringing it back to their present. And Mud so, floods, baby, say it again. Mud floods. Yeah, well, maybe so. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of, um, that's kind of my, that's kind of my new research topic. I haven't come I out with it. the first, I haven't come I out it. with the first video, but it's going to be a slow, um, so like the first video is, uh, I think it's called the founding of Alexandria. And then the, uh, and then the second video is called, um, when Alexandria was bigger than Rome. And then the third video is where are the bodies of Alexander and Cleopatra? And so it's going to be a history I love it's it. Gonna, it's going to be a history of the city as well as diving into every single mystery. Like there are some oh, videos. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going to be, um, man, I'm, I'm really excited. Like I haven't been this excited about a project ever. And, uh, and then the other little thing I'm working on is, is I'm going to do a fun series called, um, called a historian goes to the movies. And, uh, it's going to be me essentially diving into, uh, diving into a lot of these movies that have to do with ancient history and kind of breaking them down and saying, you know, what's historical and what's not. I even bought like a full uh, kit of armor for it. I'll show you. Uh, I bought like uh, some Macedonian. Uh, if you guys have seen the Colin Farrell, uh, Alexander movie, this, yeah. this, oh, yeah. this, this is yeah. from that movie. So Dang I bought it. like some of the armor to wear during the videos and stuff. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited to, like dive into that. So when we were talking about trying to grow our YouTubes and everything, that's kind of my, uh, that's kind of my game plan for this year. 
Cool. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have you back on. Uh, when you get into that series of Alexandria, maybe we can do sort of like a, a wrap up and a teaser on where it's going. That could cover a whole episode. I mean, that'd be great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the eclipse, we will drink some beers and debate on how fake history is. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it, man. Oh, dude, all all history is like, um, you know, I don't even know why there's so much of a. Uh, I don't an, even embar know why. an embargo I on it. I feel like you should have wore the helmet the whole time. Be <laughs> way better. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know why there's such an argument over like history being fake, because if you look back at at classical antiquity, it's just all propaganda anyways. You know what I mean? Like they all wanted to make themselves look as powerful and mythical and let as legendary as possible you know what i mean i mean it's it's all fake well it's like now it's like the new york times we're always like grandma and i are always like well how can they just keep posting this shit and it's just like well because in 300 years no one will know the difference and they'll just be mm -hmm. like well look at there's this crazy pandemic and these unvaccinated people caused it to be much worse yeah yeah, yeah. exactly so, man. unless we win then we'll write the books then we'll yeah. get you motherfuckers. Anyway, Luke, this has been fantastic. This is the first time we got to uh, meet even virtually, and we'll be able to hang out during possibly one of the mo most majestic things the universe has to offer, at yep. least in our corner of it. I think we get four minutes of totality. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be amazing. Yeah, I think and one, and one, one lucky person seven. is going to get sacrificed to the sun god while we're there. Do we know who yet? I have some... Uh, I it's a, a it's gonna be a lottery. I have a list of some people <laughs> are attending in that I would like to be bumped up to the maybe we could give them three tickets. Yeah, 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 exactly. So um, but man, guys, it's been a real pleasure. I you guys are so easy to talk to. Right on, yeah, it's been a blast. Yeah, where thanks, can people buddy. find all your stuff? The YouTube channel, the Twitter, all the stuff, you know, where can they find all that stuff? We're gonna put it in the show notes, but uh, you know, half these fucking people who have checked the show notes. So it's good to just spit it out here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just my name, Luke Caverns, L-U-K-E-C-A-V-E-R-N-S. Um, I think I spelled my own name right. Um, yeah. Just Luke Caverns anywhere. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, I have a lot I have a lot coming out this year and, and uh, I'm really excited to get a lot of these new projects out and published for the public to see. Do you have a schedule or anything like that, or you just sort of pop them out? Uh, um, I'm gonna start doing. Uh, I'm gonna start doing Mondays and Fridays. Um, my Alexandria videos are probably gonna come out on Fridays, starting sometime in March, and then my series, A Historian Goes to the Movies, might start coming out in March, but probably April, and those will probably be like Mondays. So Mondays and Fridays I'll post. And then I also have my series Jungle of Stone. I've got to have to learn to I have to fit that in somewhere as well. So I, I don't know. I might do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Nice. Well, I look forward to the movie one. Are, are you just gonna do theaters? Or because like most of the best movies are already out. So you have to do some. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, 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 man. I went and bought a huge collection of 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 DVDs of like all the ancient history related movies I could find. And so I'm gonna do all different kinds of breakdowns, like uh uh, one of the ones I've got planned is uh, like, um, was the Spartan kick real? You know what I mean? When when he goes, this is Sparta, and he kicks the guy in the, he kicks the Persian uh, messenger in the hole. You know, I, I'm gonna break that down. I'm gonna break down the Battle of Thermopylae at the end nice. of the hundred. Uh, I'm gonna break down. You know, was Eliz was Elizabeth Taylor an accurate interpretation of Cleopatra? Um, I'm gonna break down Netflix making Achilles black. Uh, I'm going to break down Netflix. Wait, I thought Brad Pitt was Achilles. No, no, no. They had it. They made a new movie called Troy, the fall of a city. And they made, it's weird. Everybody in the movie is Greek other than, other than Achilles. He's black. Um, you know, which is crazy when you have, uh, when you have so many, you have like the, the entire Mali empire that never gets a movie and they make a Greek character African, which is insane. Um, and then, uh, and then I'm going to do them making Cleopatra black as well. I'm going to review that I'm, I'm watching it and writing an essay on, um, on Netflix's, um, uh, Alexander, the making of a God. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the controversy around that, but I'm doing a review over that right now. I'm going to do the movie Troy with Brad Pitt, just ev literally everything. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm working on right now. 
So that's what I'm good. thinking of is with Troy with the Brad Pitt. I, was yeah, I love I love that movie, man. Yeah, me too. But dude, I I watched that one a bunch of times when I, I mean you must have been just a kid when that shit came out. I feel like I was your age. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was I was seven when that came out. Yeah, that sounds oh about right. Yeah. My mouth was putting it too, and grandma's like 40. That's crazy. I'm not so. I'm just kidding. Grandma's 40. He's only 10 years older than me, and I'm about 15 years older than you. So but we'll all hang out at the eclipse. Yeah, yeah. You guys. Head over to contact at the and uh, click on the menu at the top. Click on the eclipse. It's only 500 bucks. You guys come hang out with us for three days. See yep. the four minutes. Yeah, totality, I mean, yeah, meet yeah. us all. Hang out with us all. See all the presentations. And there's going to be some surprise guests too that are just hanging out for the eclipse with us. So yeah, I'm going to wear my, I'm going to wear my full armor as well. When you do the sacrifice, when you do the sacrifice, you'll be wearing the full armor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to. We have to do it right, you know. So we're gonna have we're gonna have the full thing on, you know. Nice. Should it be? If we're gonna do it right. Shouldn't it be a Mexican? Well, yeah. No, it's gonna be all over. It's he's gonna go over all the ancient yeah, civilization yeah. If I, sacrifices. If I were to dress up like an ancient Mexican, I I would be wearing like a rag over my waist. <laughs> And, and, and a jaguar and skin. Is like used to be part of Mexico, right? So say it again. Didn't Texas used to be part of Mexico? Yeah, 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 it did. Um, so yeah, but I'm talking about like like an ancient Aztec person. You know, I'd be wearing like rags over my waist. I don't I don't know that people would love that. So who Maybe would, would who would who would um this fellow be sacrificing? Um Christian? I would probably be sacrificing you say a Christian? Yeah. Probably so, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah, probably. I know a bunch of those too, especially in Texas. There's going to be, yeah, there's going to be a lot of Christians there um, that at at risk of being sacrificed to Dionysus. You know, I am not like a that. Christian, just so you know, Luke Cavern's, I'm a savage <laughs> Indian, so. You know. oh, okay, okay, yeah. Very so, uh, but yeah, yeah, man, looking forward to, to meeting you guys there and um I'm going on a I'm going on a huge expedition next month, so I don't know if I can come back on before then, but maybe after then we do like a recap yeah. of the event and yeah, yeah, exactly. And some Alexandria videos will be done by then, so maybe yeah. like April what we can get together. Sounds, Sounds good. good, Luke. Yeah. This has been great. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you guys so much. All right, yeah. Care, next time you have to wear the armor the whole time though. The whole the whole time I could yeah. probably I could probably make that work. I'll wear my cowboy hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do it. So okay. what do you what do you have, Graham? Uh, my, take your uh, shirt off and show us your shirt off. Titties. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, buddy. We'll see you later. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no good because Luke doesn't know that you about your prior breast reduction surgery that we've been talking about <laughs> on the show lately. So it's you know, yeah, it's, no, it's funny. The one you said you told us all about, but no one can produce any <laughs> evidence for, even with a cash reward on the table, nobody has produced. Graham speaking of his mastectomy in the past. I did. Yeah, I did. I mean, maybe I just told you personally, or but I'm pretty sure it was on the air. Yeah. No, I would know it. I would remember no way that I would feeling. I still bring up your quick witted comment from Mars One before we started the podcast. There's no way I'm forgetting about you getting a titty lopped off. Maybe. Maybe I was drunk. Was it when I was drinking? Uh, yeah, maybe. No, I don't think it was that far long ago. It was like only a few years ago. That time you rescued me from, uh, I forget even where, I was so drunk. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, you are at a club there. Well, I remember yeah. just like getting back to my house. So that's the only part I remember. Yeah. Anyway, big thanks to Luke for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Guys, support the show. Even bigger thanks if you're one of the few who choose to support our work here over at Grand America. 643, 44, 45 episodes out there, all for free. You know, if you do a donation or sign up for a new monthly, we will mention on the show, if you make a one-time donation over 50 bucks, we'll read your whole note. So uh, head over to grandamerica.ca slash support and uh, do that. Adultbrain.ca for the audiobooks. Of course, we have the audiobooks YouTube channel where you can get them for free. Uh, the podcast where you can get them. And you can buy them any place audiobooks are sold. And of course, Great America Outlawed, um, where we talk about all the stuff that they won't let us talk about here. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. Hallelujah. And we will see you next week.